So I'll just let uh, social media catch up a little bit. I just turned it on live. Uh, then I'll get my um, thank yous in, uh, and then uh, <clears throat> Sam should be on about f about five past. We're one minute past already. <laughs> oh, I can see a few of you coming on now. Oi, oi, Dave Wright, how's it going? Right, I can see a few of you coming on now, so I'll get into my thank yous. Hi, James Brown, how's it going, buddy? Hope you're good. Right, Lee Ashby here, Motocross and Speedway Memories. Uh, obviously, I've uh, interviewed one of the legends on the front of my logo on my T-shirt here that you can probably see behind me. I know that's it there, yeah. Makes it the opposites when you're looking at yourself. Um, but, yeah, I get to uh, interview uh, another one of the legends on my logo that I've had from Day Dot, so really excited about that. Hey, Craig Triplett, how's it going? Hey, he's back. Jardine Conservatories, how's it going? Mr. Luke Becker's sponsor, another top American on tonight, buddy. Hopefully a uh, future champion, Mr. Becker as well. Right, I'll get into my thank yous before I get Sam on. Uh, yo, Mr. Pryor, how's it going? Hope you're good. Thanks for your message, buddy. Much appreciated. Right, let's get into my thank yous before Sam comes on. I did say I'll do my thank yous before I got him on. <laughs> um... Anyway, big thanks for the support to Simon Pardo of White Eagle Finance. They give quality financial advice for pensions, mortgages, investments, and protection. Check the website out, www.whiteeaglefinance.co.uk. Quote myself or Motocross and Spear memories for free advice with Simon. Big thanks to the MX legend, Stefan Everts, with his S72 Gin and Vodka brand. Check out his website on www.s72gin.com. Also, thanks to Stefan. He uh, spoke to uh, Dave Stroyboss and Pedro Tractor, so hopefully you're going to have those two um, Dutch legends on soon for motocross. Uh, also, big thanks to Leo in Avon Developments. Uh, they specialise in supplying turbochargers to a global customer base, covering motorsport performance and aftermarket and OEM sectors. Check his shop site out at www.owenturbos.com and his other website is www.owendevelopments.co.uk. Big thanks to Terry Smith, a big Swindon Speedway fan, for Terry Smith painting and decorating. Much appreciated, and massive thanks as well to Craig Triplett, who's just come on uh, from Jardine Conservatories. Check those guys out on www.jardineintalford.co.uk. Proud sponsors of Mr. Luke Becker, as I just said. Um, another ride at the Rise for Wolves as well, and obviously, as we know, Sam Malenko was a massive Wolverhampton Wolves legend. Not sure who that is. Someone's not registered the name, but hello, whoever that is. He's excited for the legend. Hi, Callum. I'm sure he knows Andy Graham, buddy. It's probably uh, been in the same team, I would imagine, actually, thinking about it. Mr. Uh, Mr. Andy Graham, I uh, would have thought. I'll just go on my Facebook and see if I can see who that name is. So basically, if you don't, uh, if you guys, basically, when you come in, before you come into the video on my Facebook, you click on the link in the, in the actual post, uh, and it basically just gives your Facebook permission to use your name uh, so I can see who is talking on there. Um, so I'm just going to have a look to see whose name that was. Dave Wright's looking forward to this. That's awesome. So I've just got to turn my uh, volume right down to the bottom while I check there. There, who was that? So that was Scott Lamble. Is that right? Scott Lamble. So sometimes I can see who that is if I go on there and check. Uh, but I've got all my questions up on my uh, phone as well. So <laughs> I have to go between the two. Rocket Ronnie Corr is in. Yes. How's it going, Ronnie? Loving the Americans tonight. Don't forget, mate, to come to my motocross meeting in September, 4th and 5th. Bring your boys. It'd be a come on in, Ronnie. Come on in. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. A few of the old Speedway boys out. Jill Graham's on. How are you going, Jill? Ronnie, you'll be able to see uh, Ronnie. You'll be able to see uh, Andy Graham. It's coming to ride in my motocross uh, reunion as well. So it's cool, but it's good to get you on, Rocket Ronnie. I'll have to give Sam a shout when he comes on. All right, I can see my man is here. Done my thank yous. Yes, the man is here. So let's get the video uh, going and then we'll bring him in. Here we go. Huh. 
Beautiful. Here he is, the man himself, Sudden Sam Malenko. <clears throat> Sam. Thank you. How you doing? How you going? Awesome <laughs> to see you, buddy. Nice one. Yeah, it's been a while. You've been trying to get me on here for a long while, haven't you? <laughs> yes, I have. We've never give up on there. the idols. Never give up on the idols, Sam. <laughs> there we go. No worries. So how's it all really going? Yeah, it's all going good. Thank you very much. Um, really, good. really uh, appreciate your time, mate. Thank you. No worries. Yeah, good. Some of your buddies are already online. Mr. Ronnie Corey is here already. Look. Oh, right on. Ronnie's on there. Hey, Ronnie. There you go, Ronnie. We've done had some great times together, obviously at Wolves and uh, obviously in Team USA. There you go. I didn't hear him. Is he, can you hear me? Yeah, he'll be able to hear you. Definitely. He'll, he'll okay. comment again, I'm sure. He's just told me that he's coming to my motocross meeting at the end of the year, so that's cool. Oh, nice one. Uh, that'd be cool. So uh, what have you been doing since uh, the racing days then, Sam? A lot has been going on. <clears throat> um, well, it's, um, it's, not a, it's not a hard hard um, answer, really. Um, still very, very active with the TV stuff, very active yeah. with a lot of the speedway that's going on in Europe. Been um, covering the Speedway European Championships for uh, many years now. And um, I get as much as much as I get a chance, I'll, I'll run to the local tracks. As far as my personal stuff goes, I run a bit of a business. Um, I have family still in California, as Ronnie does. And um, I get back there in the wintertime as much as I can, too, to deal with my mom and dad that are still of a ripe age, of, um, of a certain age. And they're still needing my time sometimes. So I get back as much as I can. Okay. I hope they're wow anyway, Sam. Thanks. Um, oh, another friend of yours, a friend of mine as well, Mr. Brian Burford's just come on. He's put... Where is Rio? <laughs> <laughs> Rio's out running around. I got all the windows open, the doors open, I mean, and uh, he's out playing somewhere. I got home, I don't know, hour and a half ago, and he was crashed out and woke him up, and he's outside now. That's my cat, by the way, Rio, the cat. I uh, see. Brian's got the inside information. <laughs> what you did you, you actually did? Uh, I remember you did the book with Brian. I've got the picture up there on the screen, look. We did, how was yes. That that was, how was that? Yeah. It was um it was quite interesting. I mean, when when um I was approached um, by two different people uh, to get involved with writing a, my memoirs, I guess you'd say, from from my yeah. stories and so forth. And Brian, I knew from from before. Um, whenever I was go to Swindon, he made himself known to me many times. I spoke to him and his father over the years that used to be fans. And Brian took up journalism, and uh, we uh, <clears throat> we actually come up with an arrangement. And in that arrangement, um, it was I was satisfied with it. We we met the publishing company, and then we, we came up with um, an idea of writing a book. It was difficult to start off with, but once we got a rhythm going, um, basically I I spent a lot of time talking to Brian. He recorded it, and then we just told stories. He laid in a lot of the the facts of things that went on in my career, and we we kind of did it both in that in conjunction like that. And then I ended up getting a couple of friends of mine that read a lot of books and read read the script, and I corrected it as we went, and there's the book. And for, for the record, I did get one. <laughs> good on you, good on you. Yeah, <laughs> Very no, cool. it was um, it, it was pretty exciting times for me at then. Then it was um, a lot going on. I was really really proactive with all the television stuff. We were at Cardiff and we launched it, and it was um, it was it was quite overwhelming. Um, for the first year or so of it all it was good i think there's room for another one it's just some of the stories might not be so happy if you know what i mean but <laughs> yeah. it's all good yeah 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 yeah, yeah. maybe in down down the line then can do one of them again yeah um got uh, loads of people coming on saying hi i've also just got uh i just checked it i know i can see who that is it's paul hurry uh he's put <laughs> evening sam and lee uh what an honor and cool experience it was to become friends and ride with one of my all-time heroes one true legend. So that's uh, Paul Hurry that there. Uh... Not Paul Hurry, our speedway rider, Paul Hurry. Yes, yes. Good on you, buddy. I've, I've, I've heard you got your arm all fixed. I was talking to Justin Sedgman that was racing up against you at Kent. And I said, Paul, man, he's back. He said, Jack, yeah. how's his arm? He goes, you had it fixed, man. Really good job, Paul. I'm glad you're back doing what you love doing. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So, yeah, he's back yeah. riding again. So that's really cool. Uh, just that Craig Triplett comes on. He uh, sponsors the young Luke uh, Becker, the American. He's asked uh, what your opinion is on Luke Becker. Um, well, his results are kind of um, saying saying it all. Um, he's, mm. he's very talented. Yeah, my, my son lives in Auburn, California, where Luke was um, riding a lot. 
in his early days. Oh, okay. And I can remember Adam calling me up saying, Dad, there's this new kid named Luke Becker, man. He's, he's really good on a bike. You know, look out for him. And then down the years, here he comes. He's riding for Wolverhampton. And, yeah, he's very, very talented. Um, I, my What little bit of time I spent with him, um, when he first made his appearance at Wolverhampton in the press and practice day, the track was a bit um, probably he wasn't used to that. He had brand new equipment, went out there. Um, he didn't look so handy for the first time on the track. And Peter Adams come up to me and said, Sam, you, you're going to have to have a word with him and see what's going on there. I went over to have a word with Luke and pretty much asked him, you, you know, how's your setup? What are you doing? And he told me his setup. He told me which direction he was going to go next to get on the racetrack. And everything he says was exactly what you should be doing from what I've seen. And then he went out there in the next practice session and looked really good. So um, his his kind of writing um, tells it all. Yeah, he's doing well in Poland as well, which is obviously we, as yeah we he's know, racing the night, isn't he at Wooch? So mm, yeah, he's doing good. Yeah, mm, very competitive over there as well. Got um, John Westwood here on YouTube has put. Do you remember when Billy Hamill made that awesome pass by grabbing your push bar? I do, and me and Billy talk <laughs> about it regularly when we're together, and we yeah. have a good laugh. Yeah, we have a good laugh about it. I didn't even know he did it, and um, I think the story the story's been told before where I thought maybe my bike was packing up because um, it started it started kind of slowing down. If you, if, if in, in the motorcycle term, it started tightening up, you know, and it was like, yeah, oh, what's yeah, going yeah, on yeah. with this thing? And I backed off a little bit, and that was enough. He, he beat me. I think him and Greg both passed me, and I pulled off, and, yeah, it was it was good. In critical times, Wolverhampton versus Dudley, if you can imagine. Yeah. Yes, it was a good times yeah. as well. Well, yeah. just have to say hello to my mum who's come on. Hello to my mum, Jenny. Uh, if you can give her a hello, wave, Jenny. Sam. How you doing? Uh, it's Jackie as well, who's down there with her in Weymouth. Hi to them guys. Right, nice I've got uh, James Brown here has put, uh, ask Sam if he can remember uh, when we kept James, James Easter up when we were mucking about outside of his room in Sweden before the world final 91. Um, <laughs> Going to get wow. a lot of memories world coming final, up on here, Sam. Yeah, yeah. world final 91. Um, mm. <laughs> I don't remember, but imagine this happened. I mean, there's been there's all kinds of stuff we used to, to do. If they were involved with the American team, we, we would play some pretty cool little uh, stunts or games or whatever you want to call it to keep ourselves entertained. Yeah. Uh, Dave Wright's put uh, on here. He's put, Sam, do you still have a skid now at all? Um, I, I went back to Cal when I was in California um, through the wintertime. Um, I I had um, the guys that sponsor Billy Gennaro. Um it was uh, Denny Scopoletti and Ronnie Scopoletti. Ronnie didn't make it to the practice session, but Denny and Tim McCaslin, one of my old riding buddies, um, they they got a bike together. It took me to a new venue in Bakersfield, and I went out there to have a go. And the track was um, it's basically a small little car track, and it's clay, really difficult to to um, to ride on in the best occasions. Yeah. Um, and I was riding one of their super duper fast world championship race bikes. Because um, was it taken um, off? Was it taken off? Yeah. Well, no. Uh, Steve Wells <laughs> built the thing for Billy Gennaro, and Billy Gennaro is an animal. He can bend the handlebars yeah. in any in any speedway bike. And the yeah. thing was super duper quick. It it was very difficult to break the traction, and I didn't do so good. Um, I I lost all my confidence in riding a speedway bike on a fresh track and with the new tire and stuff. I said, you know, I can't. I did a couple of. It scared me to be fair. It scared me. I'm not mm. strong enough now to ride these things the way they need to be ridden, but. Um, mm -hmm. I've ridden. I went. I rode um, one of Eddie Castro's bikes. He was out there riding around, oh, yeah. and his bike was set up for him. And it was a little bit of a different configuration. I actually, got around, did a couple laps, but I didn't feel comfortable. But to answer that question, I still do. Um, I haven't in a while now, but I would love mm -hmm. to do it again on 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 good grounds when I got a good bike and the track's good and everything like that. I'd love yeah. to do it again. Yeah, cool. Hopefully you get to do that then. Uh, Brian come back on and said it was great. Uh, the best times. It was 1983 at Reading we met. He said. Oh, there we go. There you go. <laughs> yeah, he's got a better memory than you. I remember. I remember he was down in that area with Swindon and Swindon yeah. and Reading and stuff like that. That's yeah. it. He does Swindon. Brian, yeah. Brian's a cool dude, man. He's a yeah, guy he too. We, we we have a nice chat on the odd occasions, mm -hmm. and we end up bringing up um, you know certain uh, current things and talk about the past as well. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I've got uh, Dave Jamison here. It looks like he rides. He's put, uh, hi, Sam. Are you still doing engines? Uh, I bought two of your former bikes a couple of years ago, a Jawa grass track bike and a GM Speedway, both lay downs. However, I switched back to uprights, uh, Westlakes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, my I have a I have a business that um, kind of forced me back on the tools um, okay. <clears throat> when the pandemic came in. Um, I just got back from California, um, hooked up with a bunch of my buddies. We went to Tenerife for a week, which is was starting to be an annual thing. Um, and there, there you go. And there, <laughs> there I was uh, working. I'm working in the workshop. And then with the pandemic, I got a couple of my old mechanics back on on board. And we started saying, for their sake, um, I have a lot of really cool tools and stuff. So I said, let's do it. So we put together, um, it's probably two seasons now that um, we've been working on bikes and we're, we're super popular at the moment in our area. And I'm overwhelmed with how much work we got going on. It's almost too much, to be fair. But um, it's hard to find really good guys to, to work alongside me. So um, I'm just kind of seeing through my um, commitments so far that I've made this year. And I've been helping out two or three guys on the Speedway engines um, okay. quietly. Um, I'm not by okay. all means currently uh, on top of the game like, you know, the, the Peter Johns are and, you know, some of the other foreign tuners and stuff like that. But I, I can pick up the phone and talk to most of them and get some of the insight of what's going on. So if I have to help somebody else, I can. That's nice. Uh, got uh, Mark Cooper here from YouTube. He's put a great rider and ambassador but often our nemesis at Cradley. Uh, what, are, what are Sam's memories of the world final in 85 at Bradford? Uh, I think if it wasn't for Kainimi, he would have took the title without a runoff. Yeah, that's true. You know, it was, um, <clears throat> yeah, it was uh, the, the way my mindset was during that event was, um, you know, obviously it's a big track. I'm used to the small tracks in Costa Mesa and, and our California, Southern California circuit. So going to the big track like that, I learned through the qualifying rounds um, how to approach the world final. Obviously, I had a little bit of experience with Pool Pirates in 84. And then when it came down to that big event, I knew that what I had to do to change my style and to be aware of to keep the wheels in line the whole time around the big track, try not to scrub off any speed, not knowing really how, to, how the international guys at that level were prepared to get out of the start. I had to really um, listen to Bobby Schwartz, which was on my side. Um, I spent some time with him at his house, prepping the bikes and stuff. And his mechanic Billy was involved with our team, <clears throat> and and they they forewarned me what it was going to be like. And when I went out there, my my deal was: look, if I get out of the start and get in front, go for it. Don't make any mistakes. If I get out of the start and I get a good second, hold on to that second. Don't lose it. And um, don't put any pressure on myself to go berserk and try and pass the guy in front if I got second, if I got two points. And if I was third, really let it hang out and try to get that second place. And if you're last, go for it. That was kind of the way I did it. Oh. And um, I never got worse than a second place in the event. So uh, when Kai Nimi was in front of me, I had no idea who Kai Nimi was. I had no idea he had a, a cast on his foot. I didn't know his, his background or his style. So I just rode be behind him, and a couple of times he nudged me against the fence when I was trying to get him. And you're absolutely right. If I would have passed him, you know, the way it worked out, I would have been 14 mm. points, which wouldn't have been a runoff for sure. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So that was my yeah. memory of it. Just just be prepared and get every point you can and don't lose any points. That was what, what yeah. we needed to do. Yeah. Did you enjoy that track, Sam? I don't know if you've actually seen that they've actually just laid another track now for some car racing there. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, I've, some mm. of my guys have told me that that's going on, and I'm kind of mm. thinking that um, I love the track because it was challenging um, in that time um, riding around, you know, like going to Arena Essex or going to Eastbourne and then going to Bradford, the biggest difference is the size of the tracks. I love the idea that uh, somebody could also go to a small track and master it and go to a big track and master it, and that's what I wanted to do. I always thrived on how, how can I figure out this track as quick as possible and never lose points so i was always looking forward to it yeah very cool uh right i've got uh, i don't know what rob brian's put helen trace there why does he put that <laughs> helen trace uh, pass don't know about that mm. you'll have to let us know more about that brian i don't know what, what that's about <laughs> uh right danny hughes here has put uh you are known as a wolves legend but how did you find your time at bellevue and then whole all three tracks suited your racing style how did you find the difference from going from the upright also to the laydowns and, and the difference? He looks like he's got a couple of questions in there, Danny. Yeah, no, that's that's okay. That's good, yeah. Danny. I mean, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I never wanted to leave Wolverhampton to be fair at all. Yeah. But yeah. Um, we had, um, I made, 
it's it's like really common now when it started to become the trend um, later uh, where guys that rode internationally outside of the Britain um, were thinking that British League would be almost to skip British League and just concentrate on Sweden, Denmark and Poland and the Grand Prix and so forth. Yeah. Well, in, in, in 1986, uh, 96, I think it was, when I left Wolves, I left it because it was Monday night. And um, it was one of those things where when I left it, I didn't want to be so busy to come from Poland on a Sunday and then go to Sweden on a Tuesday and have Wolverhampton in between it. It was one of those things where economically, as well as I needed a little bit of a break, possibly, I skipped yeah. out on that. And then what, whenever I got the option to go ride at Bellevue for, for John Perrin, um, he told me a good story and I went there and it was not, it was nice to ride with him. Um, I, I think I was at that point in my career where maybe I was busy with a lot of other things going on engine wise and stuff like that, where maybe I could have done a little bit better by not being my own mechanic, own, I'm not saying mechanic, own tuner. We probably could have learned a lot of, a lot more. And when the laydowns came into it, um, it was um, it was a big learning curve because I didn't want to be beat. I wanted to figure it out. So whole was 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 a time whenever I was starting to really develop some of the stuff in my engines, and I was I was, you know, right now they have um they have the baby GM they call it. Um, I actually oh. built it whole. I was riding a Java that I shortened down to a small a small connecting rod, and I was doing that before they even came out with any engines. So that's where my development side of things were going. And I understood the theory behind that, and um, it was fun to try different things. And um, Hull, Hull was 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 good for two points. One, it was um, a Wednesday, and yeah. um, Graham Jones was the team manager at the time, so that kind of influenced me to go that way. Mm, that's pretty cool. How did you actually uh, get into speedway, then, Sam? What was your sort of earliest memory of the sport? You. Yeah, um, I don't really. My earliest memory was probably when I was 16 years old. Um, I had just had that. I was just recuperating from the big accident I had when I was on the road on a road bike, and a car hit me coming back. I just got my driver's license to ride a bike, and unfortunately for me, um, me and a car had a collision, and the car won, and I got beat up pretty bad. And at that time my mom and dad had, had already been split up in their marriage, and my mom was dating this guy. His name was Gino, and he was an Italian dude. And for some reason or another, he knew about Speedway, and he took me to Irwindale Raceway in, Cal in Southern California. Never even seen it before. I was, I was kind of, I wasn't, I don't, can't remember if I was on crunches or what, but I wasn't very good. And he took me there in his car, and we got, went, in, went in the stadium, which was a blur to me what it was all about. I sat up in the stands looking down at a bunch of guys. When they came out on the track, I mean, I, I knew what motocross was because I was a bit of a motocross before that accident. And I'm watching these guys come out and it looked like everything was chaotic because everybody was doing starts and turning around, going back to the pits, going to starts, going to the start line. And then they sit there for a couple of seconds and the tapes go up and they do four laps and they go away again. I'm going, don't get it. Yeah, that was one of those things. I don't get this. What's it all about? So that was when I was 16. And then wow. when I recovered – um, after all the accidents and all that stuff I had when I was younger, um, my next door neighbor that I went that I went to school with and lived next to since I was three years old, he had a speedway bike, and I went over to his garage when he was working on it, and that's how I really got introduced to the speedway, and that's when I was um, probably 19 years old. Wow. So, what was what uh, age did you come over to the UK, and how did you how did you get to come over to the UK? I started riding Speedway um, when I was 20, 20 years old in California. And then um, and that was in 1981, in the middle of 1981, so I was still 20. Um, and then I did my first full season in 1982 in California when they had the American World – when they had the World Championship at the LA Coliseum. Yes, yes. I so a, lo a lot of the promoters had come over, obviously, and, and – probably took in a couple of weeks or a week and w watch all the local events, didn't they? That's what you do. Yeah. And Brian made me from pool speedway. He uh, recognized um, obviously something within my ability at the time. It was only my first full season of racing. And then in 1983, I had a decent season in California and I got a phone call at the end of that year asking me if I wanted to come over to England and race, race for the pool pirates. And there's a big story there. I had no idea what the British league was about. Um, yeah. didn't know anything about it. Didn't even know yeah. the riders at the world championship. I mean, there was, it's a 90,000, 90,000 capacity stadium yeah. at the LA Coliseum. There was probably 30,000 people there. 
And I was up in the grandstands, right up in the middle of turns one. And um, man, there was just nobody around. I didn't even know what was going on, to be fair. You know, I seen I seen it all, but it was um, it was one of those things where I didn't have the ambition after that. I didn't know until I got that phone call from Brian to come over to England and race for him. And then I realized there's another world of racing over here. Crazy. What went on then? <laughs> uh, I've got uh, yeah, go on, sir. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, Michael McCormick, uh, Michael McCormack here. He's put on uh, YouTube. I watched Sam at Arena Essex score 21 points uh, maximum, I believe. I presume that was, and he had his engine tested. Does he remember that? <laughs> um, I think that happened a couple of times um, in my really? career. Yeah, um, yeah. Always seemed to be uh, um, stemmed up from from uh, Colin Pratt because he was uh, crazy. <laughs> You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, there was always rivalry there. I mean, yeah, I did. I mean, I can remember doing the. I think, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, I went to Brad, uh, went to Arena on a Friday and then I went to Bradford on a Saturday. And I think I maxed both places. And that, awesome. yeah, so that was, that was kind of an achievement. That was kind of, you know, being, being with my, when you're, when you got a good mechanic, you, you, you weigh up when you're traveling to the racetracks and stuff about, you know, what's going to happen, how are we going to deal with it? Then you leave it going, Hey, we're at Bradford tomorrow. And I say, great. Another, we can just keep the maximums going. Right. And we just worked our butt off. And it was, it was, it was fun to be able to have that relationship with your mechanics and go out there and do the job. Yeah. Very cool. Oh, I've got another American legend on tonight. I've got Dennis Sagalos has just come on. No way. Dennis. Yes. He's put, <laughs> okay. Hey, Hey, Sam. Hi, Sammy and Lee, both looking good. Uh, you had a great speedway career and did America uh, America proud with all your victories. We didn't get to compete all that much, but I remember you were fast. Congratulations and all the best in life, man. Awesome. Wow, nice one. Hey, there's a really good story, and it came up the other day about okay. Dennis. Yeah. Dennis cool. rode for Wolverhampton in my first year yep. that I came to ride for pool. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody said something to me about, oh, I know what it was. Oh, you, this is crazy. Um I was at Mallory Mallory on Sunday watching the the road racing and I and I'm involved with one of the race teams that built some engines for them. And we were there. There's Rio, by the way. And um, Rio. I built yeah. And uh, there was it was wild. At, at, coming out of Gerald's at Mallory, go down the back straightaway, a long straight before you get to Edwina's. And then you they're going two bikes hooked up together, and the riders got knocked off and the bike was on its own going down the straightaway, right towards where we, where we were, going parallel with us. It hit the grass and dug in and flipped. It was, um, we were so lucky to get out of this. It missed us. It hit the fence next to us, but it knocked over a pole with the, with the loudspeaker on it. And it hit my buddy behind me right in the groin. Yeah. And it knocked yeah. him on the ground. It was pretty gnarly. I mean, really gnarly. And he's on the ground and his nuts are, he's hurting. He's on the ground. The paramedics came up to him and going, you all right? And we're sitting there going, and then he asked me later in the pits, he goes, Sam, have you ever hurt yourself like that in racing? And Dennis Segalis was, <laughs> when I first came to Wolverhampton to race, I think it was Preb and Erickson took me out in the first corner or something like that. And I went down in the, into the fence. There's a big, big crash between me and Preb. And, and um, man, I hit my groin so hard. And I'm on the ground choking. It was bad. And Dennis came over to my side to see how I'm doing. And I go, Dennis, how are they? How am I? And I think he went down there looking and says, yeah, man, they're still there. They're so, still there. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of the first time I really kind of met Dennis. We never really got to race together um, or hang out together, but um, he's a cool guy. Yeah, got up a close yeah. and personal straight away. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, so that story That's came up, by the way, yeah. If That's you remember cool. that. Cool. Yeah. Very cool, very cool. I got uh, Neil Burrows here on YouTube. Uh, put best wishes from Neil uh, Burrows and Pete uh, Rathel. Uh, thank you for doing the events for Long Eaton Speedway Reunion Group. Oh, nice one. Yeah, I've had some good times. Yeah, it's a pleasure doing those things. Whenever, whenever they get me there, it's always fun. Uh, I'm just checking on the name on this one because I can't see the name. And the <clears> name was Annette, Annette Brody. Right. So Annette Brody just put, Hi Lee, thanks once again. Having to watch this later, but just a note, I was invited to Sam's testimonial. I have a great video of the after party. Annette okay, Brody, guys. Yeah, <laughs> nice one. Yeah, we had some good fun. I, I really tried to pull it, pull it off on that thing. The weather kind of spoiled a lot of the things we were doing, but I put some effort into it and um, it was fun. No matter everything, at the end of it all, big memories. Okay. 
Uh, got Ian Swervin Hewlett here. He's put Sam. Tell them about Brigo up at Indian Dunes. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's that's my buddy Ian anyway. You probably know him. How's it going? Swerve, they call going, me yeah, Swerve. Yeah, how's it going, Ian? Um, uh, I think I think um, he's he's got the venue wrong. It's out, it was actually at Saddleback Park when I oh, met Brigo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and do you know about Saddleback Park? Have you ever heard of yeah, it? Yeah, I've heard it's, of that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, in, 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 in Southern California, right where I'm from, there was probably three or four race motocross tracks that I used to race at. And Saddleback Park had an oval and they put a speedway track on there. And um, it was right when, um, right before I got married, I bought a speedway bike. And then um, during that um, wedding and all that stuff, all the boys in the wedding, we hung out together. And we went to the Saddleback Park to ride around there for the first time, really. It was just me trying to learn how to ride this thing. And we went there one day, and we rode around. And then we there's another track. There was a speedway track, which was small and conventional to Southern California. But then there was a bigger track, like a quarter-mile track, maybe 400-meter track. for the. I think it was mainly set up for um, the flat track guys. But there was a speedway bike over there riding. And we had to walk up a little bank, look over the top of the hill, and look down. And there was two guys down there practicing starts. And we ended up going down and saying, hey, you guys, what's going on? What are you guys doing? You're on the wrong track. Come over to the little track. And it was Tony Briggs. It was Briggo's son. Oh, yeah. And he, and he was there with Chris Martin, which was a mechanic and a speedway rider. Yeah. I, Chris got hurt riding um, Speedway and broke his leg. And he was on crutches helping out um, <clears throat> uh, Tony. And uh, I went and asked him. He said, no, no, we're here just practicing starts. And I said, oh, okay. I didn't understand that really because obviously I didn't know what the British was all about at that time. Yeah. And then yeah. Tony, Tony told me, what he did and i said oh yeah i've heard of you because my dad's my dad has a, an engineering motorcycle race shop and some of the racers there um knew briga and whenever i bought the speedway bike and brought it back to the workshops where my dad's shops at, right? <clears throat> um they said to me oh yeah we know briga and that's how i related this tony briggs brigo and he said my old man's coming coming out tomorrow come back so we thought cool so the next day uh, we came wow. back and sure enough wow. briga was there Briggo came over, Briggo came over, come on, let's go see what you're all about. And I went and rode around on the little track. And I'm skidding around there, and he asked me what my name was. And I said, Sam Ermolenko. He goes, Ermolenko? That's a Russian name. And I said, yeah, okay. And he goes, all right. And he goes, he goes, are you are you going to be riding local tracks? And I go, yeah, if you can get, from what I'm hearing, they're hard to get on. It's hard to, you got to sign up, and within two or three weeks, you can get, go on the rotor, and you'll get on, get on the list to ride. And um, he said to me, he goes, oh, I might be able to help you out there. I can always tell Harry Oxy, the promoter of the racetrack, that you're one of the Russians. Put you in a red suit. We'll call you the mad Russian, and we'll, we'll get you out there riding. <laughs> and that was going to be my introduction. And I kind of looked at him like, what the hell are you talking about? And then at the end of it, I figured <laughs> yeah. it out. To get rides, you got to have a gimmick, right? And I said, no, yeah, no yeah. I'll, just go, I'll just go out there and earn it. And that's what I did. <laughs> that's what Swerve was talking about because I told him that story years ago. That's pretty cool. Did he give you any tips and all that there when you first saw him? Or? He basically told me all I need is laps. He goes, you're, you're doing all right. You just need laps. And that's that's what any any young speedway rider needs is just plenty of laps on the track. And that's exactly what Briggo told me. Cool. That's nice. That was a great story. Uh, I've got Philip Ford here because I've just checked on my phone to see who this is because it didn't come up on here. Philip Ford said hello to Sam from Phil in Dorset. A lot of fun in his first year. A true pro and an absolute gentleman. Is this the Phil? Ford? Is this Philip Ford, my um, John Davis buddy? It's got to be Philip Ford, yeah. Yeah, it is. How you doing, big guy? Yeah, no, he was a part of it. Um, I actually, I think he even did a lot of mechanicing for me when I was down in pool, and um, showed me a lot of stuff that him and um, it, that he that he had experience with. Yeah, it was. I mean, that was wild times down in pool because straight in the deep end. Um, mm. When Michael Lee got um, suspended, he wasn't on our team and we had to do a lot of extra rides at the time. And mm. hell, I didn't know what I was doing really. I just out there racing my speedway bike. I was known from Midlow and all those guys as Mr. Loud because I talked all the time and shouted <laughs> things. And and um, there's another good story I'll tell you in a second. But I used to be called the one, two, three, go guy too because I couldn't make a freaking start for nothing. I would, you know, <laughs> when the green light would come on, I'd kind of go like this and look down. The tapes were up already, but I learned how to pass. I just worked it out. That was the good old days with Carlisle's too. That was that was good tires and West legs with a lot of grunt. You can get in there and ride. 
Just shows that you're so raw when you come over and just learning as you go in the defense. That's it. Yeah, we, we had a, we had, we had a bit of a get together as we usually did as a as a we're down in pool, so we were so far away from all the other midland tracks that we'd hang out together as riders. And one time we're at the promoter's house having a bit of a kind of after after speedway gathering in the, inside their house. And Simon Wig was in there, and we're all sitting in like the dining dining room type thing. And the setting was lots of chairs, and everybody's hanging around. And I was talking about the racing, and I was talking about how I was going on the outside, and I was really hooked up and on the gas doing it. And then Simon Wig, I didn't really know him. I went to Weymouth and watched him once, and I knew the name. He was in the room, and he looked at me, and he goes, hauling ass on the outside. Does that mean like pulling bottom? And I kind of went, what? And the whole place lit up laughing. I'm going, I get it now. You know, so, yeah, it was just Americanism, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah love, a, love a bit of that Americanism. Uh, got Ian Little here. Uh, he's on YouTube. He's put, hi, Sam. I spent a lot of time on the road with you and Danny and helping Danny in the workshop when he was busy. Good times and hope you're well. Oh, I'm well. Thank you very much. Yeah, doing good. Yeah, I speak to Danny on the odd occasions. Not as much as I'd like to. Um, but yeah, we had some great times and Danny was an ultra professional uh, mechanic. It was the first time ever in my speedway career where I let my bikes out of my possession and Danny was down in um, um, Hertfordshire, I think, and where that area. And it was, he was doing all the bikes in a, in a bit of a barn there and he had a great setup and he had a lot of people down there that would help him out. And um, we had some great times then. Yep. Uh, Callum Marshall has just put uh, Lee Ashby. He was the Wolves team manager for Peter Adams one meeting. Is that right, Sam? Yeah, I, I, I stepped in a couple times when uh, Pete was on holiday over the last probably five years or something like that. Yeah. Did you enjoy was, that? Um, um, Sorry, I took it serious. Yeah, I took it serious mm -hmm. because um, it's important to make sure that, you know, when you're a writer, you got somebody that's that can answer your questions, whether it's what helmet color am I in, what race am I in, and you know, should I be thinking something different from a writer's point of view? I can give them a little bit more information and I can, I can pull them together, walk the track together and, and do all the stuff. Peter Adams has got a couple of things he does every time you're at the track as, as you're doing a track walk. So I would make sure that I, I, I did the same things he did for, for fun. And um, we had a good time. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I mean, the, the rules, when I see the riders, sometimes it's hard when you have to take a rider out or replace a rider or or something like that you know you gotta you gotta have a little bit of um knowledge of what the writer that's coming up can possibly do on a track that's might be changing so those kind of things i enjoyed thinking them through yeah that's good tactics and all that uh, i've got uh glenn uh pope here i've just checked that it's, that's what his name is he's put evening guys samo what a legend those were the days at monmore sam and ronnie it was a privilege to be able to watch sam through his career just an outright entertaining top class rider, and in my opinion, the best rider to wear the Wolves colours. He is the best team wow. rider as well. Speedway just isn't the same these days. Yeah, thank you very much for that. That's a, that's a right, flatter that's to hear that. Nice. I mean, I I know I've gotten um I've gotten caught out in my career a fair few times when I look back at it when I was being too nice to help some of my buds. You know, sometimes you feel confident that you can go out there and and ride any conditions and drop a couple of points if you have to. I mean, a qualifier, for instance, for a world championship or something, maybe get one of your buddies through or something, and it kicks you in the butt afterwards, but oh well, that's history now. But yeah, maybe, maybe I'm too nice. Um, I've got, uh, this name's Carl Brevet. I'm looking on my phone. Uh, do you think you retired at the right time, Sam, or could you have raced for longer? Um, the, the, hard, the hard thing about um, the change in the laydowns and so forth, as you can see in the modern day racing, the riders have to be quite, quite good athletes these days to, to ride a speedway bike. You have to be very strong and um, and fit uh, for that. Even though it's only a minute and so many seconds of a race at the best of times, you, these bikes are really hard to handle um, because of their their characteristics of how you got to ride them full full tilt. And on some of the worst tires and the worst tracks at times, especially in Britain, sometimes the tracks aren't so forgiving. Um, I found I couldn't train. Um, I had a I, my knee was was damaged really bad in 1989 when I had that crash in long track at Herxheim, and uh, I lost my cartilage and stuff like that in the knee, and it was basically bone to bone for the rest of my life, really. And it was like the train was very difficult in the gym. And uh, even though I had um, the last couple of years of my career, I had a 
a professional um, trainer. Uh, we could only do certain things to keep myself fit. Um, but the leg side of thing on that right leg was deteriorating uh, on a daily basis towards the end of my career. And I knew I had a crash in Sweden when I was riding for um, Rose Pagana, Greg Hancock and Travis McGowan were on the same team when I was, when I was managing the Reading, Reading Club for John Postlethwaite. Um, and I, I basically came down on my neck really bad and it scared the hell out of me. I was in the hospital. I didn't, it wasn't publicized mm. because it, 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 for some reason, it didn't get out that I did that. But um, I, I crashed hard. I seen the, I seen the next day's uh, newspaper and it shows my body straight up and down. I, I do an handstand with my neck kinked under. And I thought, man, I'm a lucky man. I've had a good career. I've had some bad spills because um, I'm a trier. And that scared me enough to where I thought it's time to give it up. And I just said, that's enough. And then it was, it was five, four or five years ago. I've had a knee replacement now and my life begins again. Is it, is that okay now? Sounds that feel good. Yeah. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, there was a times when I used to travel to the airport and it was hard to walk from gate to gate and mm. you had to use every elevator and everything just to keep it calm. And if I had a race meeting, and traveled back, it was difficult. Um, yeah. you know, I was used to it because it happened when I was 16 years old when I got my first crash and messed up my leg. So I've been used to the pain. But whenever, I, since I had the knee operation, it's like, no pain. Unbelievable. Wow. It must have been a relief. Yeah, a big relief. Yeah, yeah, and I don't realize how much nicer it is until after yeah. I had the operation, had a year and a half yeah. down the road. Man, yeah. I play on my motocross bikes and I can go do things. I'm, I'm living again. It's great. It's nice, yeah. You've lived a bit so long that you almost got used to the pain almost. I, I did. I didn't realize how much pain it was until it was gone. Yeah. I mean, people used to say to me, does your does your knee hurt or do you get aches and pains when it's cold? I'm thinking, shit, I always got pain. But now <laughs> it's like, it's, now I feel other pain, you know. That that's like, that's just yeah. old pains, yeah. 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 That's okay. uh, I got uh, Melody here. I did friend, she, we friended each other earlier on uh, before the interview. Did you? Uh, that, she's put, hi, brother. That's my sister. My yeah. sister, she always says I'm her brother from another mother. <laughs> yeah, that's my sister. Yeah, yeah. she's supposed oh, to be working right now. What are you doing? Yeah, what's she doing? Checking this out. <laughs> Maybe it's your break time. <laughs> yeah, I, I got Sean McConnell's just come on now as well. Oh, sweet ass. Yeah. Uh, any stories about the Tamworth jump? Laugh oh, he's such a he's such a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Lance King's watching this, he'll 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 know all about it. Yeah, I've seen and him it was it, yeah, it was it was his motocross buddy that did all this, and um, okay. I got I got the shit into the whole deal. Um, right, here's the story, and this is the truth, okay. the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Okay, amen. <laughs> right, we I I lived down south, as I said, down in down in pool. I came up for an indoor motocross event that was going on at Birmingham, and at the NEC, and. Um, I don't remember who I stayed with, what was going on or whatever, but um, we all went out because we're all together and we all went out to a club and I was married and stuff. So I wasn't really into, I wasn't into whatever was going on, but the single guys and, and, and then we were all out in the clubs having a great old time. We left the club that night and a couple of guys were even, I think, I think even Lance was laying on this in the, in the, in the gutter or something, puking up or whatever. in his nice new shirt. I remember that part of it. So he was jelly, man. He couldn't, he couldn't even, we had to walk him. We had to carry him out of there. Well, we were, we didn't know what to do, but I was the only sober one. So I got to drive Lance's Beamer. Now I don't know. I don't know the Midlands that well, do I? I'm from pool. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going, I don't know how to get home guys. Where are we going? So I can't remember. I think it, I can't remember his name now. The motocross guys. I should, the motocross guys should remember. I mean, I'm sure Sean's going to remind me in a minute. But anyway, we're all in the car. I was a sober one, so I'm driving his car, and we're going. I'm just saying, which way to go, guys? Left, right, whatever we're doing, and we're going. I mean, we're going 30 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, whatever the speed limit was. And there's mm -hmm. it's called the Tamworth jump, right? And there's a freaking <laughs> peaky jump for cars. That you can't okay. go over it more than 15 miles an hour or you're going to get uh, right? Okay, I'm doing yeah, yeah. 30 miles an hour, whatever, and he's going, go faster, go. You're all right, Sam. I'm going, what are you guys doing? <laughs> we hit this freaking jump in Lance's car, and we're up in the air, and we landed. <laughs> I can remember everybody looking in the rearview mirror, what the hell just happened, and everything, <laughs> and the lights come on, and um, that was it. It wasn't even nothing to do with me other than I was driving the freaking car, so – we pulled over to – the lights came on. We pulled over straight away into a petrol station, and then 
we're thinking what we're going to do. Um, it was leaking oil, so it obviously hit the oil pan and knocked a hole in it. So we filled some oil up on it and got home on it. And I just turned the car on and turned the car off to get going. We were we were a mile or so away from his house. We got back, and sure enough, the next day we all went our own ways. And I got I got the, I got the shit side of it all, saying that I wrecked his car. Well, yeah, I was driving the car, but it wasn't. It was his freaking motocross buddy that prop, and probably Sean had something to do with it. Who knows? But Lance probably never that forgave me. Yeah, that yeah. Was. Yeah. yeah, Lance probably never forgave me for that, thinking I still owe him for whatever his damage was in his car. <laughs> uh, racing it, racing it over the Tamworth jump. I wonder if it's still there. Yeah. The jump's still there. It's definitely there. Is it? It's like one. Of, it's, it's one of those jumps where. You have to know exactly where you're going to get to it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, there's I, I ride I ride my Harley now, and I go out riding on it. And there's a couple of places where I know about where there's where there's really peaky things. And you know, if if you got guys on the other side of it, I can show you. I can wheelie my Harley now. <laughs> I go over <laughs> and let the thing go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to go I can't and check that it out. Any other way? Yeah. I just say Sam and Malenko has been here. I need to check this out. <laughs> uh, right, I got Thanks, Sam Sean. Corbett. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. <laughs> Got Sam out of that with a question in that. Uh, did Sam go to Poland on the John Smith tours in the nineties? Not, not, not to Poland, but to Czech Republic. Not, um, not to Poland. Yeah, we were we were already established in Poland, and that came from um, um, from Collins, um, Peter Collins. Peter Collins. He's the one that he's the one he's the one that set that up. He, the first tour oh, I went okay. to Poland was Peter Collins got us both all all of I think it was Mitch Shearer, Jeremy Doncaster, and myself. Maybe even Ricky Miller, somebody else. He took all of our bikes over, and we all flew in, and that's when Poland just opened up for the foreigners. Wow! But with uh, with got, John, it was all about Czech Republic. Okay, fair enough. I got Danny Hughes here. He's put, uh, how did you find riding with your brother or against him? Um, <clears throat> yeah, my brother Dookie, Charles. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, he's eight years younger than me, so when he came over here to race, it was more. You know he's got to find his own feet. There he is. He got to find his own oh. feet and how he's how he's going to do it. And um, yeah, it was it was exciting times. Probably too much of a, too much of a dad figure I probably was because I was more into showing him how to make sure he puts his money where he's got to put it and take care of himself and set himself up for his future. Really. So yeah. when it came down to riding ability, he had natural talent to ride a ride a speedway bike, no doubt about it. Without really having any motorcycle skills. Because he was eight years behind me, so I was already racing here when he was 14, 15. I was over here in Europe, so he never really had me to ride with him and stuff like that. And like I already mentioned, my mom and dad split up when we were when he was really a child. Younger, was only, younger. yeah, yeah, very really young, yeah. Ah, oh, interesting. I got uh, Kevin Wheeler here. I know him well. Uh, he's in the UK. Uh, we both raced motocross uh, schoolboys in the nineties and stuff, and he's put. I remember when you turned up for a motocross schoolboy national event, and myself and many others were in awe of seeing you turn up. <laughs> I don't know if you oh, remember wow. doing that. Yeah, okay. I wonder if it was that would think it would have been down south in pool area or yes. down there. Yes, that's yeah, where you come yeah. from that area. So south yeah, yeah, because area. because my relationship when I was down in pool, I met up um, with the with the, some of the I don't know if you call them sponsors. They were just people that were watching Speedway. And um, I got to know these guys. They were into motocross. They're fathers of the motocross. Oh, yeah. And they had sons. And then, obviously, being an American, they'd ask me, how do I get the pro circuit stuff? How do I get the cool stuff uh, from yeah. America? Yeah, yeah. And then I would, I would arrange that because I knew Mitch Payton and I knew all the guys over there. Wow. And I, I would be able to be able to say, yeah, give them a call and order something, get it sent to my house in California. And then next time I went back to America or I'd get it shipped over. So they had, they had a, they friended me um from that side of it but then again they became they're still some of my best friends right now there's a guy named john dent that's down there um that uh, was a motocross guy and uh, i went with him to a few of the motocross events because his son raced and my son then got into it so he ran i think he i think adam my son actually rode in one of the nationals and it was john dent that put it put him on that put him on the on the track really at that time so it was just one of those things to give my son some experience. It didn't. It didn't go. He didn't. Um, he didn't really try to be anything more than just enjoying it. My son at the time, but John and all those guys down there. Um, yeah, I, I, I have still got a lot of good friends down there. That's very cool. I got someone here. Uh, can't see the name at the moment. But how do you think uh, you would have fared racing in the Grand Prix later on, rather than the one-off World Finals? 
Uh, would you have won more world titles if it had been Grand Prix back then? I think that's what you're trying to say. Yeah, well, I did the Grand Prix, didn't I? I did the first yeah, few. Yeah, I know you did. Yeah. I, yeah, I got knocked out of them because the it was too many um, technical things they changed at the time with the tires and stuff and the mufflers and whatever. And, you know, there's, there's, there's no – there's, yeah, there was a lot going on in the early days. And the Grand Prix side of things, I loved it because I loved the marketing side of it. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. I can remember when the Grand Prix – started it up tony rickardson and myself were the first ones to get the big big race trucks and two around in the grand prix and stuff so i understood the vision of what was going on and um, i think the grand prix is a marketing side of things gives the riders a hell of a lot more opportunity to to get more attraction and get some sponsorship which is what everybody needs i was talking to my swedish mechanic which is now the the swedish team manager uh, morgan anderson um we were talking about he said to me the other couple weeks ago uh he probably didn't get the years right but he says i was i got into the sports 10 10 years too er, late or too early you know the the, the wrong, wrong side that. of it yeah, yeah i should yeah. be in it now with the skill i yeah. had then you know what i mean yeah. and yeah, um then i would have been i would have been reaping the benefits of the of the big bucks if you'd say mm -hmm. yeah. obviously you had that uh amazing night uh winning the one off world final which was obviously you have to, you have to get it all right on the night and all that um, there was even uh, controversy in that as well with you in hands and everything. What was your memories of that night? Obviously, it was an amazing Well, night. you know, in, in every world championship in the days of the one-offs, everybody would always tell you you need a little bit of luck on your side to be able to win a world championship, even if you have all the skills in the world. That one day, that one night, anything can happen. And being a one-off final, you could, you could have an engine failure. You could have anything happen, right? And you yeah. could lose enough points where you won't get it, and you got to wait a whole other year to have that opportunity again. Yeah. Well, that happened to me a few times. You know, I didn't yeah. have my luck. And on that yeah. night, man, no matter what happened to me, I had the luck, and it all went my way. So that was my night. I mean, I got 12 points on the board to win it, you know, and that's that's unusual to win a world championship and one off on 12 points. I didn't even have to finish my last ride, and my bike did break in the last ride. And I did have problems with my mechanics, mechanical side of things. Um, but over all in all, it was one of those things. It was another meeting. I was really, um, I was rebelling against the FIM at this time. I didn't really, that was the time when they were trying to get all the riders. There's Morgan Anderson right there the, holding the clipboard up. Uh, it was one of those things where, where, um, you know, they were, they were trying to build um, the show where they wanted the riders to come as early as they can do. Cause I mean, at that world final, the final was on a Sunday, but the practice was on a Friday and there was a gap from Saturday. So what are we supposed to do all day Saturday? But they wanted us at their function, um, call it the FIM gathering uh, the Friday night after the practice, just so they can, sh I don't know what it was about. It was just one of those things where I'm thinking, you know, what, why are we here doing this? Why do we need to be here? We're here to race. And, they wanted us to participate in things, which I get it. Um, and there was a lot of controversial things happening through the Grand Prix when it started out. They wanted riders to be available on the Thursday right to the Sunday, you know, and stuff like that. Because they didn't really know if they could teach us speedway riders the new system. You know what I mean? Well, now everybody knows the system. And if they say be there on that time frame, you got to be there at that time frame. That's the schedule. But then they were trying to embed it into the speedway riders heads this is what we got to do so i rebelled a little bit on that world final day and it just so happened to be my son's birthday on the world final day too so oh, i made okay. sure yeah i made sure that i i went away I, I didn't i didn't go to the hotels that were on offer in parking um for this for the world championship i went about an hour away and went to a golfing village and my son was really into golfing so we, we took him there with my family and we camped out there for a couple of days and then come the come the practice, me and I, I showed up at the track and and did the practice, and then went away went back to my villa, let's call it an hour away with my family. And on the Saturday, we're thinking the track was so slick in practice, and parking was known for being really slick. I, I said, let's go back because it was raining. Let's go back. So me and my mechanic Danny, we went back to the track. And visited on Saturday. We had to jump the fence to get into the stadium because it was all locked up. And when we went out there and walked the track, we couldn't believe our eyes. The track hadn't even been graded or touched from the practice. And this is a freaking yeah. world championship. It was actually you seen the grooves in the in the track. 
you seen the wear the dirt from the what dirt was there no they didn't even they didn't even groom it before it rained and we looked at it going this is like this is ridiculous isn't it i know it's a world championship what are we going to wow. do and we're yeah. thinking well the track was that slick it's going to be slick we got to get our bikes to hook up so we went and found an old farm building off the beaten track where we were staying an hour away and went there and asked the foreman if we can use the shed and we pulled the bikes out and i took I took the engines half apart and i changed the engines me and danny changed them and i needed a part that i didn't have to help me that i thought would help me so we ended up thinking well where can we get the part well autumn latin hammers in just outside of munich he's a big tuner there and they had the golden grapes event at um Landshut on that saturday night so we what i called up um Lanty, Atlanta, and I said, "Hey, can I get this off you?" And he goes, "Sam, I'm going to the track tonight." So we said, "We'll meet you there." So we went there, got the little part I needed, went back to the thing, finished it, and then we went racing. And guess what? The track was a plowed field because they just rolled it, and it was just grippier than hell. And my bike wasn't set up for that, but it sure worked. There you go. It all worked out. What was what was your yeah. actual feelings on that day? It must have been amazing, obviously. Yeah, I had the option of getting on a plane afterwards and flying back to England. Um, and I, I just, my mindset was um, I won the championship. I was so damn serious about it because of everything that was going on, it was my son's birthday. I ended up yeah. saying, you know what? I'm not even going to get on the plane. I'm going to ride back with you boys in the, in the, in the van and we'll just, we'll just, uh, we'll take it all in as a team. That's you know that's what we did. That's nice. And yeah. um, we came back and we had to get it. We had to be at Cradley the next day for an event there. And I think I went out there and fell on my butt and hurt my hand and whatever. And that's the history. Beautiful. Um, what uh, was that? Did you have any certain bikes or engines? Uh, I've heard a lot of the guys sort of talk about that they had some special engines. They even give them names and things like that. Uh, did you have any special <coughs> engines that have favorites? Over the years, <clears throat> I think we kind of invented that in our camp. Anyway, yeah, every one of my engines were named. Every one of them, were they? and they were named. They were, yeah, they were named because of the how we were creating them. Um, okay. um, being being from Southern California, and if Dennis is still listening and stuff, he will know. And uh, the guys from California, if you're in, over there, there's a lot of really good um, tech guys that know and build components. So we had access to get certain connecting rods built and pistons done and valves done and stuff like that. And because I was a bit of a motorhead, I would search out all these different um, column combinations. Um, you know, I, my, my thinking was in the days, in those days, you had four guys on the racetrack and there wasn't very many options of motors. You'd buy a Westleg, a Jawa, and there was a Garden. Um, and then GM came in in 84, they came on the market. But before that, it was either a push rod Westlake engine or you had an overhead cam. Westlake made one, a couple of overhead cams, but I never experienced those. Or you had the Jawa overhead cam or you, that you just had limited amounts, but the, the actual engine components were pretty standard. There wasn't much things done differently internally. So I made things differently, I made things different. I made my own engine combination. So. We made things with longer rods, so we called that one Stretch, and we had one called Gertie. We had one called Moneymaker, and we had one called whatever. We just Wilma. We just had all different names Wilma. because we built them. We built them in the shop, and something was yeah. on the radio or something. And yeah. what are we going to name this? You know, and that's what we did. Yeah. Ah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I do. I've liked some of them stories that we've been getting. Uh, I've got Gray uh, Woodman here. He's put, uh, "Hey Sam, did you guys really understand how much we hated the Cradley spoons?" <laughs> uh, okay. pity they can't get a track so we can do it all again <laughs> yeah it was it was it was a it was a time um in the history of our sport that was pretty unique wasn't it i mean yeah. i think it was going on for years and years but i got the experience luckily and um going from overhampton to cradley and whenever if you recall going to cradley you have to drive down go in and you have to get to the pits is all the way down one of the straightaways and you got all the fans there all sitting on the terraces and you pull your van up there and they're just all surrounded around your van and I had to work out ways of my mechanics telling them I'm not with them in the van I'm coming in a car somewhere else so they would leave me alone and then they would sneak my bag into the dressing room and I'd sneak out of the back of the van when everybody was gone and and, and that's how I'd get in so it's like you just didn't want to put up with anything did you? you just wanted to race but 
yeah. it was definitely um, big, big rivalry. I didn't really know a lot about it. Uh, one time I was, um, well, you do know, but you don't. Um, yeah. I was, uh, I was in one of the World Cups after I retired um, with the boys in, in Hungary, and Billy and Greg were in there, and we we're all sitting at a table having dinner one night. And um, I didn't realize that that the the Cradley fans used to chant about me when I'd walk down when I'd walk walk in the track, and I didn't realize what they were chanting. And I found out, and I couldn't believe it. They would say five foot six foot, five foot six foot, because my legs shorter, right? And then, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I laughed like oh, I never even heard that. Yeah, they said, yeah, they've been doing that for yeah. years. You didn't know that. Oh, you went yeah. to a panto villain, did they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. That means you must have been a special rider when they make uh, special things for you. Yeah, well, it was. I mean, Cradley was a was a was a pretty pretty cool track as a racer. The shape of it was really neat, and um, I, I spent um, uh, you know I've had some success around there. It was it was it was really good to uh, to go there and win win some silverware on some of their annual meetings that they had. It was it was fun. I see you and Billy there, uh, Sam. Uh, can you remember them? I remember them. They sort of come in very quickly and left again, didn't they? The front discs there. Um, yeah, the front disc became um, a hazard. Um, mm. Not so much, not so much on these um, smaller tracks as they were on the bigger tracks. Mm. And I mm. think Tommy Newson was one of the first victims of that racing in Poland. We were all racing, and the roost of the tire hitting the front wheel um, would offset the the rider. And it made it to where it was dangerous. So they, they soon became uh, banned and, and not being used. But yeah, that's right. Over Hampton Wolves. Still with me? Are you back? I have no sound if you're there. Oh yeah, there we go. We're back. We're back. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, nor do I. Yeah. So we're where good. Where were we? Where were we at? We're talking about the front wheel, the disasters. Yes, that's the front it, yeah. wheel disc. Yeah, yeah, it became yes. dangerous. So we we ended up. Um, yeah, we ended up getting. They were they were banned after a while for for um, for uh, reasons that they were putting riders in 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 problems. Uh, what sort of, uh, obviously I know you, you had a, you were at Wolves, but what was, uh, did you have any favorite tracks in uh, the UK? <clears throat> tracks you enjoyed? Um, I think I enjoyed them all as long as they were prepared good. Um, I just like a good right? racetrack. Yeah. yeah, it was a matter of, if the conditions were good, man, it was, a, I could ride anything and I enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I think it's because I, I could win on almost any of them and that's what made it enjoyable. I didn't, excuse me, I didn't really have a track where it was a bogey track of pretty much, Everywhere I rode, I figured it out how to do it. 
Did you enjoy all the contrast of tracks? Obviously, you had, like you said, the well, Arena Essex ended at Lakeside or whatever, but, and then Eastbourne, <laughs> Exeter, massive. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I actually, the challenge was, it was just exactly why I was in the game, figuring out how to do it. That was what kept me, kept me on my toes. I think s some of the ones you just mentioned, especially Eastbourne, you used to have to, you used to have to battle the guy that was a, the track creator, and he would really mess it up for the, for the away team if he could, and that was another part of it that you had to deal with too. So it was one of those things where I didn't, um, I didn't, I didn't kind of think about it. Other than let's let's figure it out before they mess us up, you know that was another part of being competitive, is if they're going to do something to you, let's turn it around and make it work for us than against us, and that's what we did, pretty much in my whole career that way. I just got Dave uh, Dave Avery's come on and said hi Lee. Uh, apologies for Sam for all the stick that we gave him when you came to Dudley <laughs> Wood. Uh, a true legend in the world of speedway. So thank you for the entertainment and great races. Hashtag respect. Yeah, respect to you, bud. Yeah, no worries. Hey, that was pastime, right? This is now time, and we all we all grew up. <laughs> but <it>. <laughs> if we wouldn't have we wouldn't have those memories to talk about if it wouldn't happen, right? It's just oh, like true. there's a lot of tracks you go to that you don't even talk about because we didn't have that kind of rivalry, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Cradley versus Wolves, man. That was a big, big. Okay. That was a big day, yeah. man. Yeah, great atmosphere and great tension and all that sort of stuff. And um, did you have any uh, favorite? Cavalars or levers? Um, didn't you get a specially made? Were they specially made for the final that time? I remember those white ones you had. Yeah, the white one. The white ones were made out of, um, uh, I think it was goat leather or something. I don't know. It was really thin. I mean, the whole thing weighed nothing. You yeah. can you can squeeze it in a small ball. Unfortunately, I, I lost those. Um, oh, that, yeah, I never never what we um, I sent them because right after that Kevlar um, Gary, I think it was Gary Havelock and myself both had contacts on getting Kevlar um, produced for us. Yeah. And um, the company that I, I approached, which my company that was building my race suits was uh, Gerald of GTS. He asked me if I could get the material. Mm -hmm. So I, I chased around finding the material and the company that would, would make me a suit out of Kevlar said, can you please send me the suit and I'll do it. And at the time that was the suit I had to send them. And I never got it back ever. So that, that's somebody's probably got that. Don't even know what it's about, you know. But I'll tell you, if anybody's got it, it's a really light white suit with the ripped ass because it was that thin that at the end of the competition it tore. Yeah. Um, that was it. Yeah. So I never got I never got that one. I had a duplicate one yeah. made, but it was more. It was different. It was the it was the normal leather, and that one I think Troy Lee's got it in his museum. Oh wow. That's pretty cool. Do you keep? Did you keep any like sort of race jackets or any of your catalog <clears throat> leathers or anything like that? Ah, man, I hope I'm not saying the wrong thing. Everything I ever had, I still got. Wow. The only things I got rid of, I I I, I did help out somebody one time with the racing suit, and then I really didn't like the idea that I can see my racing suit going around in second halves and it's yeah. torn apart and kids are riding them, and I thought that's not very classy. I thought, you know what, forget that. Just throw them in the box. Um, I, over the over the years, my son Adam, when he was, you know, he's he's the son, and I'd say, hey, we got to do this this week, and let's move this box, and let's do that. We moved things around so much that he got tired of moving things. So we packed everything up, and I have a, a storage storage place where everything's in it. And um, one time, when Adam Adam married um, married into a racing family. Mm -hmm. And they he worked out that, you know what, maybe I should go back and try and get some of my dad's cool stuff. So he came back into town a couple times and just collected all the cool stuff. So he's got a lot of the the really um, cool race jackets and stuff that, that nice. I won a lot of championships on. He's got them all. He's got a really good collection of them. I, um, I still got a lot of stuff, um, and I just got it buried. Um, it's going to come out one day soon, but at the moment it's just out of sight, out of mind. I, I live in a very small – uh, small place. I don't have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I keep it simple because I travel. This is really my English pad, let's call it. Yeah. Um, I still got a couple of other things, other properties and stuff, but this is where, you know, I just keep it simple. Yeah, okay, fair enough. Uh, I've got uh, an Ian Fletcher here. I've just put his question up because I'm just checking my phone. He's put, what advice would you give to my son who's watching uh, on this? Uh, he's racing. <laughs> he's 11 years old and he's in this year's British Youth Championships. Interesting. 
Um, well, there's no, there's no advice other than stay safe because your career doesn't begin until you become, I mean, you know, the, in motocross, your backgrounds, for instance, if you're a 15, 16 year old kid, hothead, you're good, aren't you? Cause you got the youth on your side. You got the physical side of things on your side and you're natural talented speedway. It's all in your head. Well, it's not all, but a lot of it's in your head where you have to be really, um, you have to be really focused about, uh, doing the right things at the right time and speedway speedway um I just got my motocross buddies coming in now <laughs> yeah um thanks guys hi billy um yeah so um you got uh you got to really just stay focused and stay safe yeah you're gonna you're gonna figure it out on the day on the race day where your advantages are take advantage of those advantages and don't go out there and try to win everything go out there and try and win something and come away with some knowledge and some experience and live on to the next day. Yeah, that's very cool. There you go. Uh, there you go. Check that one out. Uh, I've just got your uh, sister's just come on as well, uh, Melody again. Uh, I did have a question about asking you about wheelies. Um, she's put, how old were you, Sam, uh, when you used to do your wheelies? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody knew about my wheelies in my neighborhood, and that's why she's Same, asked yeah. that. <laughs> e e everybody, um, I was, I guess because... I was, I don't know, I started riding motorcycles when I was probably eight or nine years old, but never had a motorcycle to go riding and racing with, but I would definitely ride. And then we had some fields where we grew up where we can go riding on. Um, we had to push our bikes there because it's on the roads. And then you get there and you you do what you got to do. But um, whenever I had that accident at 16, um, I was rehabilitating. And the only thing I could really do was sit on a bike and do the controls, you know, hold the throttle, do the clutch and do the brakes. So I couldn't do physical things, really, but I knew how to pop a wheelie. And if I pop a wheelie, and then Doug DeMocus, man, he was a legendary wheelie king. And when he came on the scene, um, I just remember, um, God, I can do that. And I, I had really good control with my right foot on the brake, and I can do my throttle and my clutch and everything at the same time. So I'd pick up a bike, and I could hold it and wheelie it. And I did that any bike, every bike. I could challenge me, I'll wheelie it, and I did that, man. I had a – I had a – a sportster harley sportster when i was 17 years old i even wheelie that sucker so Did you? <laughs> whatever yeah anything i can get wheelie i can do it and i, think, I just uh, kept doing it yeah I think and the other, the other thing <laughs> is yeah no the other thing is if i had somebody on the back yeah all right no worries if i had somebody on the back it was easier because their weight's on the back and i just tell yeah. them hold on to me as hard as you can yeah. to pick the thing up and then you could get it right <laughs> and that's so my sister my my neighborhood friends and I tell you, every one of the girls in our neighborhood, we're all there was a bunch of kids all the same age. Everybody will tell you a story about when they got in the back of me and I wheelie down this. We had a long straightaway street and I wheelie down the thing every, every time. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Did, you, uh, did you just like, uh, obviously, when you started doing it during the speedway and everything, did you enjoy obviously entertaining the fans with that as well, that side? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was, it was good. Whenever I rode for pool, um, mm. Uh, there were, they had, they had, I can't remember the name of it. Um, there was a couple of forces force there and we'd go right in mid middle ditch. And some of the other guys, I can't remember who it all was, but we would get to go out riding motocross bikes and there's some dirt and stuff. And I really around there, Well, then obviously uh, being close to Brian Maidman, the promoter at the time, um, he's caught on that I could wheelie. So I even wheelied around pool speedway on a Kawasaki and just rode yeah. around. I rode through, I rode through the grandstands all the way around the outside, rode onto the track and wheelied around. <laughs> and, um, if you, if you go online and look at, uh, Sam Ramalinka wheelie in that Meldura, you'll see me messing around in the interval and wheeling around. Never even seen the bike before I got on it was wheeling it around. So wow. was this, this one, Sam? Um, no, it was, it wasn't on a speedway bike. It was on a motocross bike. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 I can, I can really motocross oh, speedway. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah. Speed speedway itself. Yeah. yeah. There's, you know, the, the, the things I like doing with speedway was not dragging your feet, wheeling with both feet up. It's hard to do. Yeah. Um, you, any, I think most people that know how to ride a motorbike that's got kind of those kind of skills can drag their feet and wheel them, mm. but wheel them with, with your feet up, you know, that's what you want to do. I and that's what they I don't do that, to. do they? They don't do it like that. I've noticed. They yeah, you like so, to either put it on the seat, hang it on the back yeah. of my card, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean that's the easiest way. I mean that's entertainment too. Don't get me wrong. That's that's great. You know what I mean? Yeah. But my that's deal cool. was, yeah. yeah, my my deal was ride it like you're racing it. You know, wheelie yeah. the sucker. Yeah, that's that was cool. It. Man. Yeah, that's really really cool. 
Uh, I've got a uh, Polish guy here, Lucas uh, Nowacki, I think is pronounced. Uh, he's put, how did Sam get involved with Poland? And wasn't he a bit scared coming over in the early 90s to race over in Bidco? Um, right. Well, my first experience with Poland was 1986. When I went to the world final at Katowice. And it was um, it was overwhelming, but that was still the iron the iron curtain was there, and you had to go mm. through all that. Yeah. Um, um, and 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 basically, it was Peter Collins, as I already mentioned. Mm. He put together a tour to uh, bring riders over there to show off um, the talent because all the clubs they had they had opened it up to foreigners can come join the league. And bit gosh, I mean, I wasn't scared of nothing. I was actually up for the challenge, and to me, it was like. The money was good at the time. Yeah. The traveling was a bit difficult, but you didn't need your best equipment. You just needed good equipment. Um, they sure caught on to that. They're, they're the seniors now. They're the ones that are driving the, the big speedway ship right now. They're the ones building all the good stuff. But, you know, they're, the modern technology has got the Poland, but at that time it wasn't there as mm. far as speedway goes. So you can go over there with a good setup and pretty much earn a lot of points. Mm. And we've got Dougie Wire has come on as well, and he's put a great interview, Lee. Very interesting. I remember Dougie Wire back in the day. Yeah, I know Dougie. Yeah, he's yeah. way cool. Yeah, yeah good day. Cool. Uh, Simon Corbett obviously mentioned about the England-USA test matches were classics uh, back in the day as well, in the sort of 80s and 90s sort of era. They were very cool. Uh, what was your memories of them? There were some great test matches, weren't there, over the years <clears throat> of all the countries? Yeah, the, the whole thing about the American team was, was mm. so so – so genuine. Um, whenever we would um, get over here for the start of the season, at the time John Scott was our team manager, English guy. Um, he would he would try to make sure that we could all get together pre-season or even right into the season, a month into the season, so we get together and talk about our selections and what we're going to do at different different ways of who we're going to pick and who's going good or what's going on. So to me, that that kind of um, a build up was was all part of it you know we, we had some we had some great ambassadors you know with um bobby swartz and geez i mean ricky miller was in it with me at the time we were both learning the trade uh, ricky had a little bit more experience than i did but you know the guys that had the experience would come in and share it and we would have i don't know we'd meet at somebody's house and at the time it was ricky miller's house which is bruce penhall's old house in in um sutton coldfield and Bobby lived around the corner, and Lance King lived in Tamworth around the corner. We'd all just get together and meet about, talk about what we're going to do. And being Americans, we 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 never put any um, uh, pressure on each other. We just said, "Right, guys, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? We we can agree to anything quite easily, and then say, "All right, we're going to do it. Let's go." And that's how we do it. And every time we go to the racetrack, we wouldn't let anything bring us down. But we probably maybe weren't the best team in the time that I was in it. Times we weren't, times we weren't. But there was times where we had to work out what the best teams were doing. Mm -hmm. And if it was down to qualifiers, you know, there was times where we got sucked into their believing that, you know, let's say we're going up against the Germans and we're going up against the Czechs and we got the Swedes and the Danes and, and the English and us where this is our world team thing or something. And we know damn well that the – that that Danish rider is going to beat that German rider in that race. And if that Danish rider beats that German rider in that race, then we're going to be in that position. But if you let the German rider beat us, beat the Danish guy, then it's going to knock us out. And that stuff went on, mm. you know, and I didn't believe it until I seen it. I thought that's bad, you know, yeah. just race. That's what it's about, isn't it? No. Yeah. So anyway, there's John Scott in the background of that one. Yeah, so we had, we, we went there to, pull off some of the things that we had to do as a team and we never we never looked at each other if it was somebody was going better or somebody was good at that we put them in we never we didn't we, we didn't hold any punches but we at the same time knew put the best man forward that's what we got to do yeah for sure uh did you have any superstitions or anything like that on that side of things sam <clears throat> you i think there was times when when you're on a roll where everything's working, um, things are going good. Um, there was there was a couple times there where I had weeks and weeks where I was unbeaten, and you start to think, damn, I got to put my socks on the same way this time, don't yeah. I? Or I got to put my knee brace on this leg first. Oh, I did it wrong. I take it off and do it again. And then I thought, you know what? Screw that. That ain't gonna work. And I took. I don't. I don't. I don't. I mean, having number thirteen in the world championship, you know, that's bad luck, right? People say, well, in America. In California speedway racing, 
you had to you had to apply for a number because when you race there it's individual so you have to apply for a number when you get a license yeah. and there's a list of available numbers and that when you first start out they're three digit numbers and the only way to get a two digit number is if they're available you have to have some experience and get to the get onto the top half of the programs of, of ability and then you get to maybe select a two digit number to get a one digit number they were all taken unless you were number one then you get number one right mm -hmm. So it was one of those things where when you're looking down the board at two digits, nobody wanted 13. I took that sucker. <laughs> so I'm not superstitious. I like that. I like that. <laughs> you hit it head on, head on. Yeah, yeah. Who were the who were the biggest influences in your career, Sam? In um uh I mean like speedway people? Yeah, just or just general, anybody in general that yeah, the big influences in during your career helped you probably out. the doctor probably the doctor that told me I'd never race or never do anything when I was laid up in the hospital in Anaheim, California at 16 years old. He said to me, son, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to ride motorbikes. And he goes, I think you better try a different thing. I said, hmm, nah. Uh, no, I didn't I didn't and, and as far as um look, it comes down to I mean, I was I was tutored in school because of the accident. I still had a few years left of school. I couldn't go back to school. I was messed up, man. I was, I was in and out of hospital for almost a whole year and a half or whatever. And I didn't get the opportunity to, to, to even realize what the real world of being analyzing somebody. I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. I just knew that I can do that. Right. I can do that. Right. And that's what you do. So you just get up in the morning thinking what's going to happen today. And then you just work it out when it comes down to, learning to ride a speedway bike, I thought, well, how do you do it? So you do it and you figure it out. And I think my very first big lesson in speedway was I had some good buddies. I thought were good buddies because in Southern California, I was a married man. I had two kids. I had my own business. I was riding a speedway bike and I had to do this for fun because it was something I can do because of my physical side of things were handicapped from riding motocross. I'll do this. And then I started going on the circuit when you go to we get a we get a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, a Thursday night, a Friday night, and a Saturday night if you want to race. Mm. Well, I thought I own my own business. I can do that. Mm. So I'd go along. And as we travel, we'd meet up with the same guys after each racing that were on the circuits. And we'd go have a pizza afterwards or a beer or something and talk about the racing. And that's what we did. So some of these buddies were pretty cool. And one of them was a guy named Mike Freya, which had some racing over here in, in the UK. And I was racing in a championship and we always had some good battles, always had good battles and left each other the room. And this all of a sudden, one time I'm going around him and he freaking fenced me and I rubbed the hand. Freaking what's, I come in the pits and I go, dude, what was that about? And he goes, Sam, it's a championship. I went, oh, all right. Boom. So now you have to be ruthless as well. You have to take what's yours, right? And that's yeah. it. That woke me up. And I said, all right, I want to do this now. Yeah. And that's that That kind of turned me around. Got your competitive spirits, guy. That's it. I understood then. I was good enough. I had the ability. Didn't realize I had the ability until I started beating these guys. And then I said, I get it. Now I'll do it. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, what, rider, what riders were your favorite to team ride with uh, over the years, Sam? There's obviously quite a few guys I think you had <clears throat> good chemistry with. Um. Hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, I had the most team riding experience with Ronnie Corey. Mm. Uh, Ronnie Corey was, me and him had a good deal going. Ronnie liked to, like the inside gates more than you like the outside gates. And he was a good gator. Mm. So you can almost put him on any of the two inside gates and almost count he's going to get there. Yeah. Um, I was a guy that could ride the dirt if I had to. If I didn't make the start, I'd make the big turn. And I'd be, I'd, I'd be really good at, track craft i think enough to be able to to cut my way through mm -hmm. and me and ronnie just had this sense between us we just knew how to do that mm -hmm. and um <laughs> we only had one mishap that i can remember in the whole time and i and i it was my problem because i cut back on him telling him i was going around him and actually come underneath him he thought it was competitor slow down thinking it was the other guy and i ran up his back wheel and i fell and i got hurt but other than that um he's probably the guy that I had the most riding experience with. And there's other guys like Graham Jones. Graham Jones was was lower down in the team. But mm. we used to always say, and this is what Peter Adams used to always say to me, Sam, can you do anything with him? I said, hell yeah. So I'd go over to the rider and say, look, in this race, you got to make the start because if you can do anything out of the start, I'll do it for you. Just get in front and I'll do, do the rest. Mm. And that's what we did. So if I can get a Wayne Carter – or uh, Andy Phillips, or any one of the guys on the team in front of me, I'd get them home. 
And that's what the deal was. So it was down to me to make that happen. And I, that was what I loved doing the most. It inspired them and great team riding from you. Yeah, as well, exactly. You yeah. Obviously, you had a great British career anyway. Obviously, you had a massive, uh, you're a massive icon and legend at Wolverhampton Wolves still to this day. Uh, you must have uh, loved your time, obviously, there. Yeah, it was like, um, I mean, Chris Van Stratton, when he came into the when he came into the club under ill fortunes of uh, Peter Adams at the time, I and mean, Peter Adams is the one that gave me the phone call. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was like the way it happened was obviously pool um, management changed, and they had some problems for 1985, so they didn't continue to race in, at pool. So I was left on the sidelines. Now I had 84 here. I bought a bunch of equipment with my profits and took it back to America with me and started building my own engines and my own bikes and stuff in California, thinking that I'm going to come back to England with more, more assets of the stuff that I knew engine wise that I learned. And I learned a lot of it hanging out with Michael Lee because he was quite clever at doing stuff. And I got to spend some time with him in his workshops. And I took that knowledge with me back to California. And I, and I used my racing buddies with my dad, like I said, my dad's shop had racing guys in it. And we just did a lot. So when I came back to, I was coming back to England, I thought in 1985 and no, no phone call. Um, so then what happened was um, I rode in the 85 in the season in America and then I made the world final. And then come 86, I thought it was going to be the same thing. I'm not going to get a, uh, get a phone call. I'm going to have to stay in America and race. And I had a good gig going in America. I had good sponsors. I was making good money. I was, I was doing a good thing for my family at the time. And the next thing I know, I get a phone call from Peter Adams telling me what I'd like to come over to ride for Wolverhampton Wolves. And I said, well, okay, well, his, his, his pitch to me was, look, I helped Bruce Penhall. Um, I helped Eric Gunderson. I helped, I've helped all these guys in my time, and I made him a better rider. And I believe that you're that kind of guy who can make a better rider. Mm -hmm. So why don't you come join my team, and I'll show you. So I said, all right. So I ended up moving in with Peter Adams, living in, in the family home. And unfortunately for him, he had problems with his marriage and stuff, and that went pear-shaped. And I was stuck on the sidelines going, oh, crud, and I'm in the middle of all this, and I got a race. And Wolverhampton's now looking like it's not going to happen because it's going to go bankrupt. Mm. And then Chris Van Stratton came in. Um, he was the assistant team manager with Pete. He held the club up for a couple events. And then Tony Mullen, a consortium of uh, local sponsors, all got together and sat me down in an office and said, look, Sam, you're probably um, one of the key key persons in this team building thing that we're doing. If you decide you don't want to take a pay cut and continue on, we're going to have to close shop. And I says, well, what are we going to do here? And then they told me, look, if you could just hold up this year, help us get through the year, we'll make it up in the years to come. And Bless the man. He did exactly that. He held his he held his side of the bargain, and uh, Tony Mole and Chris Van Stratton supported me through the rough and and the rough sides. In 1980, I had the big horrific Herxheim accident, and I was on on the bedside for another year. Couldn't do nothing, man. Financially, I had to rebuild myself, and they were very generous, and um, they made me the guy I am today. That's a good shout by Kevin there. Kevin put, did Sam understand the Black Country accent? <laughs> I, I do now. I yeah, didn't then. Not yeah, then, I didn't no. then. How about here's a story? How about when I lived in pool and had to go up to Bradford to learn how to, to race, right? And and this 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 road system when it comes to signage is way different than American. In America, it says 395 miles to San Francisco or something like that, right? <clears throat> you get on that highway, you know you're gonna pick in San Francisco. Here, it doesn't say 300 miles to Scotland. You got to go from village to city to city to city. Yeah. And if you don't know all those names, you're going to get lost, right? <laughs> Hell, the dialogue from Poole to Bradford. Can you imagine every time I wow. pulled over and I said, yeah, yeah. how do we get here? Up top of the hill. And, you know, they, I'm just going, <laughs> what did he just say? <laughs> you have to go back and ask the next guy a block down the road and see if he can figure it out. Yeah, it wasn't the sat nav days. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, big roadmaps out. I got, oh, I just had uh, Mario uh, Giroux just come on and said, hi, Sam. All right then, how you doing, Mario? Good to hear from you. Yeah, Even though it's good. this way, yeah. He's he's a Czech Republican. Yeah, he's a he's a good racer. Yeah. Yeah, he was good. Uh, good fun. What were your uh, memories of also winning the World Cups as well? Obviously, was that special for you? Obviously, with your team, uh, USA. Absolutely, heck yeah. yeah. When the American boys are together to win any silverware was uh, precious. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And <clears throat> a lot of times we, you know, we had our backs up against the wall, maybe not not good enough, maybe, or maybe we were good enough, but maybe not lucky enough, just like any racing. So to win anything was good, really good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you won a lot of. Uh, it was overseas finals as well. I'm sure you won quite a few. Four, I think, or you won. Um, okay, do you remember them ones? I think they were always yeah, the, company, weren't they? Yeah, well, there was well, one was at Bradford, but I don't know if I won them all. I don't know what I don't know what I won, but um, yeah, um, I don't. I think I won one at Pool, Coventry, but yeah, they're just another trophy, right? See that nice big gold trophy? Yeah, I thought I, I, when I first won it, <coughs> it couldn't have even have been that night right there when I first won it. I thought I get to keep that sucker. Hey, you got off the podium and they took it away. I just went, what the freaking use is having yeah, this thing in your hands? In <laughs> what's going on? Can you just give it to me for a year? No, nope. yeah, got to keep least, it in yeah. the cabinet. Uh, at that point, I thought, yeah, whatever. That's <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Uh, you also won the World Pairs uh, final as well. What was your memory of that? Yeah, um, you know, every every memory um, is there to, to to hold on to, and and you know, we had some. <laughs> the, I think you showed a picture of um, it was me, Ronnie, and Greg. And if that was the picture, I think it was. It was when we were in La Niga, yeah. and uh, me and Ronnie. Uh, we're probably in good form and we were the ones that we were going to race. We were racing the event and then whatever happened, um, we needed to win something, but it had to be from a certain gate. And um, whether I wasn't good enough to take the gate or Ronnie wasn't at the time, we had to make a decision and Ronnie stepped down and Greg came in, man, under pressure big time, but Greg was a gator, right? So we got to put him in the best spot. Bam. We won it on that decision. That was American pulling together and we won it and it was like there you go that's how we do it you know we're a team and let's just use our assets and greg was a super good gator and it was a hard one for him to take the pressure to come in on that one but he did it and we won it so there's been some great memories uh um winning championship with the boys it was almost like um everybody knew about the american special sort of camaraderie thing but <clears throat> It's almost like the other countries needed to sort of get like that. You seem to have the best team spirit. Like well, I, I I get it now looking at it. I think the Aussies are probably the closest to what Americans are when it comes to that kind of camaraderie when everybody, because, yeah, yeah. you know, it's probably the sunshine. It's probably our lifestyle. You know, we, 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 we know what it's about. We know why we're here, um, you know, and, and maybe we're being so far away from our homeland. We don't get the pressure of being on our home territory, right? If we were having this world world team champion, excuse me, championship in uh, California once a year, it would put the more pressure on us because we have to do it in front of our own crowd. Yeah. You know, here you you know if England's England's hosting the world championship, England's going to be under pressure. If it's Sweden, it's Sweden. If it's Denmark, it's Denmark. Unless those guys are in form, right? Mm -hmm. Those guys in form can be the superior ones no matter where they're at. Um, but being Americans, we knew we can pull it off. We. We, we get up in the morning and it's a new day. Let's win this one. Let's go do it. You know, we didn't have a routine where we're, you know, we're not regimented to training or sleeping or eating or any of those things that now become are now the norm, isn't it? And for anybody to be a, a professional athlete in today's modern time, you have to go through those things. And, and I believe in them. I really believe in the structure of things like that because that keeps you focused. And if you're focused about your job, then you're going to succeed in it. And that's, I'm a firm believer of that. But we, we were more like individuals, but we come together with all of our talents. And then we would have that one special day together because we're all there together, right? This is us. Let's do it. We didn't have to, we didn't have a secret one. We just knew we just, let's make it happen, right? We didn't have to tell anybody our secrets. We just had to pat each other on the back and say, we're here together. Let's do it. That was enough. Uh, my brother's just come on as well, and he put Sudden Sam, a legend and great at commentating too. <laughs> oh, thanks. 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 Cheers to that. Yeah. I wish I had more of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I enjoy it. I really do. Yeah. Yeah. It's just nice to uh, hear your experiences come through in the commentary as well, which is good. Um, in the, um, Also, you, uh, I remember the British League Riders Championship days. They were like world finals on them nights as well, weren't they, Sam? The, 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 <clears throat> the competition was massive in them meetings. I remember you won a couple of them. As well. Yeah, Lee, Lee, that's good that you noted that. They, 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 yeah. It wasn't so much the riders probably did that, but the, the best league was the British League, wasn't it, at some mm -hmm. times? It was the one that all the top riders were at. 
So if you got every number one represented in a club in the championship, man, that was a hard championship because the world finals at that time weren't loaded like that, were they? They had like seven guys that year, eight guys that you know can do it. You might have the one one out, but when you got an intercontinental and a continental and the overseas, and you bring them all together, you got some of the best riders, and some of the best riders were on the sidelines, which should be in the world championship, right? But this was one that was better and harder than I have to put my battery on. Hold on, harder than a world championship. Yeah, it definitely and, uh, was. Yeah, yeah, and then you know you're representing your club. Now, some of these championships would have been super nice if they were on neutral tracks. You know, wouldn't that be cool that they took all those riders to a track that we don't ride every day? Yeah. To me, that would have been the next thing. Then we'll see who's the best, right? That's <laughs> yeah. I always look for the advantage and let's make it let's make it level. Definitely. Yeah, those, those championships were 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 good, and and one that sticks in my mind was. Um, we because uh, I had we had our own engine shop here at my house, mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> I was I had a good engine, but it was an engine that I wanted to ride, and it happened to be at um, at Swindon was the championship, and uh, I knew that I needed this engine tuned up a little bit before service before I rode it, and I had many nights of racing in a row, mm-hmm. and I needed help, and I trusted Graham Jones to come on board. He was my teammate at Wolverhampton. He knew a little bit about engine. I said, Graham, can you just come over and use my workshop and strip my engine down and do a couple of things for me and get it prepared so I can sleep and then I'll be all right. And guess what? We want it. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff is me because that, that effort was put into it, right? We won. Yeah. So that's it. The combinations, you throw them all in there. So you got to have a little luck on your side that everything goes good. And I think at that one, Martin Dugard and Hans Nielsen were battling it because they were both really fast. Mm-hmm. And I snuck in there somehow or another and won it. I don't know if I went around somebody or did something, but it was, a, it was, I remember going away from that. Me and Jonah to this day talk about that because that was special times, man. Yeah, I was there. It's my hometown as well. So <laughs> okay. I was there. <laughs> yeah. Loved it. Um, obviously, your memories as well. You did a lot over in Australia as well. Um, <clears throat> the series stuff over there. and Yeah, the series 500 uh, yeah. ran by uh, David Tapp, man. A legend yeah. over there. He always calls me a legend. He's a legend. He put us together, man. He put 10 years of a touring around Australia. That is just like, yeah. When you look back at it, how special was that? That was just yeah, one of those things where you get over there and you can, you can enjoy the, the, the sunshine. You can, um, you can just, and, and the tracks were challenging as hell and you're on tour. And I was just telling you to Justin Sedgman that was using my workshops because he was, he traveled, he's up in Glasgow and he rides for Sheffield. He was, he was down here using my workshop and he's sitting there cleaning his bike. He's on his own, doesn't got a mechanic at the moment. And I go, what's this remind you of? It reminds me of Australia because the sun's been shining, right? <laughs> and it's like he's out there cleaning his stuff up and stuff. And I said, the only thing is you got to race it tonight, right? Where we used to have our – we'd have our week before racing or a couple days before the next event, and you get there in the sunshine and clean everything and polish it and put it back together and go racing. Yeah, super good times over in Australia. Is Todd Wiltshire there with you as well? Yeah, I think I did. I think I did thirteen years or something like that. Yeah, Todd, <clears throat> me and Todd traveled a couple of years together. Um, you could go on the tour, and and David Tap would um, have everything arranged, or you can go there and do your own thing. And me and Todd hooked up together, and um, basically got a trailer and a car, and we traveled around, and we brought APW over there, one of my buddies that's never traveled, and um, so we had we had some good times and good memories. Um, I enjoyed my interview with Todd as well. I had to, I was, before I forget. Uh, I remember Maureen Maureen uh, schooling. She sent me. Yeah, this. yeah. Uh, still got that. Did. Still got that. Yeah. She asked me if you if you knew where it was. Yeah. Yeah, I still got it. It's in it's in I the storage. It. Heck yeah, yeah. Really? If I if I if you if I pat it out, <coughs> pat it out in the past, and um, it starts to fade. You know, if you get don't got it in the right place. So I just decided to preserve it and put it put it put it away for now. She does all the helmet colors and all that as well, doesn't she? She and, does, uh, yeah. She's she's um, definitely been involved with Speedway for a long, long time. She comes from Mildura Speedway is where, where I met her and her family. She also said that uh, she remembers that you sent her your book at the time with uh, some writing in it, and she was uh, she said she was really uh, – it was really cool. Oh, nice, nice. So that was really yeah. nice. So that was nice. Yeah, yeah. By that. that was quite cool. <clears throat> um, who are your sort of closest friends uh, during your Speedway career then, Sam? Um from the rider side and all that sort of side. And was it sort of quite hard sometimes when you were bar to bar with them guys? Um, uh, being a married, married man, you know, obviously my family was the first thing. Well, when I say it was the first thing, it's like, that's where I got to come home to. Right. So you couldn't, 
you had to be at home as much as you can do. Um, I guess, I guess, um, rider wise, um, Jan Steckman was a really good buddy of mine through my career racing with Wolverhampton. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we probably spent the most time together off track and stuff like that. Um, other than that, there's a fair few of them. I mean, the guys, all the guys I rode with in Wolverhampton that were available to come to my, cause we had a workshop, right? We had an engine building shop. So we would help as many guys out as we could do to help our team win. And so the relationship grew because they became involved in knowing my family and stuff. But when it, um, when it comes down to uh, racing, um, it's usually your mechanic. Um, you and your mechanic have that rapport that is pretty special because you both know, um, and one of my deals, I love going to the racetrack with my mechanic that's working for me that night because we can talk about stuff. I can jump up in the bunk in the van or something and get some sleep to get there and be ready to go and let him unload it. But our routine was get there, unload the bikes, the the the, <clears throat> the riding bag gets put in the dressing rooms. I jump out of the van a little bit fresh, you know, so I can avoid everybody, get, get to the track weigh it up, take my mechanic around there, talk our strategy, our setups and our bike, and then do the team walk and come back in and tell my mechanic, give him the nod that, yeah, we're doing that, we're doing that. And that was the relationship that we needed to be successful all the time. And it was enjoyable because he he worked his butt off to prepare my bikes for me to go out there and win. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing more better for me to give him that reward back to say, yeah, we did it, thanks. Yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. I've just got Ian Higginson that he's put, hey, Sam, I'm loving all your insights. Oh, cool. Thanks. Yeah. I've just got uh, Neil Griffiths come on. Uh, he's put a big hello from Neil in New Zealand. It's going out all over these live uh, interviews. He's put, thanks for all the memories. Uh, me and my dad were at Pocky in 93, surrounded by Danish fans. Uh, okay. The best, <laughs> the best day ever seeing you become world champion. Also, thanks for giving me a boost when I lost my way presenting my dad's award at Wall Speedway back in 2006. You gave me a cheer, and I remembered my uh, the words, you're an absolute legend, mate, simply the best. Oh, thanks. Nice one. Cheers. Very nice. Very nice there. Uh, I've also got Dave Edgar here. He's put, hi, Sam and Lee. Sam, do you remember Park's testimonial at Ashfield? You rocked that day. No, oh, yeah, I do. That was another another um, good, good little venture because – when he asked me to do it, <clears throat> I think I think I was between mechanics, or my mechanics couldn't be available to go to to go to Glasgow. Yeah, and um, I ended up getting my buddy Ian Swerve that that came on your show earlier and asked a question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. he he's not a mechanic, but he goes, "I'll go with you." Uh, so yeah. we drove we drove in a little dinky minivan, one one bike. <clears throat> we drove we drove all the way up there. Um, got to the track late. Um, because we couldn't find it for whatever reason, sat in Ave, we don't have that, whatever was going on. Yeah. We got there late, we pulled in the parking lot, and we're thinking, right, we got to get ready, because he doesn't know, he's not a mechanic. I just said, I think the bike's set up, Ian, just go put it over, let's do it. I think we won every race but one. I think John will beat me in one of them. And we won a lot of prizes that he put on, toolboxes, power washers, so we had to shove it all in this little van and drive back. So that was, a, that was really a good time, really good time. Uh, there's no name on this one, but they put, uh, I remember when Wolves lost the title at home to Bellevue in 1993. Well, I was in the hospital. Uh, I was in the hospital that night, wasn't I? Yeah, so my memories was, I think, the uh, week or two before that, um, mm -hmm. I crashed out trying to go around Kelvin Tatum. Um, um, probably a little bit cocky I was because I knew the track and I just went in way too deep, went too wide, slid out. <clears throat> hit one of the posts, which they've now transferred the all the fences, so they're not posts on them. Mm -hmm. And I jarred the post. It was it was a quick stop, but it was enough to hurt me. Put me in the hospital that night with a broken leg and a broken back. And I'm thinking, oh darn it. Um, and we were kicking butt, but Bellevue was on our tail. And the way it ended up, it came down to I think Bobby Ott was for Bellevue and. He was a winning man for for Bellevue to, to, to win the championship over us, so it was. Uh, I had to listen to all that from the from the hospital bed, so not good. Not good at all. Um, personally, as a Swindon Robins fan myself, uh, my dad and uncle both raced for Swindon. But did you ever come close to signing for Swindon at all? Or? No, never. Never had any talks with them. Um, you know, Wolverhampton was my club, and I, it was when I left there. Um, it was that was me 
trying to change the world, doing my own thing. Um, no, never. Um, always Wolverhampton um, through and throughout. It was only John Perrin that approached me and um, Graham Jones that I went to hold. But then it was Trevor Swells at Peterborough at the end of my career, <coughs> which that, that track I loved because it wasn't so brutal on my leg. It wasn't a tight track. You can just have fun on the motorbike. And that's where I finished my career in Britain. Uh, you won, obviously, a lot as a team rider and as an individual. Uh, did you prefer to be part of the team, or did you like the individual, or did you like both the same? Or I think I liked the team one because there's seven guys who do the job, not just me. So it was more of a – it was more of a – not the pressure wasn't on me to do the job. It was just let's do it together. Um, that was um, – I had really good relationships with all my team managers and team club owners all over the world when I raced. And I think they believed in me, and I think I had the ability at the time to, to go out there and do the job and also bring on the team. So that was the fun thing about being the team man is you can get into the dressing rooms and the team manager will come in and talk or whatever, and then they would look at me and ask me questions, and I'd tell them my thoughts. And then, you know, I would help them in any way and every way just to be that team winner. Um, on the individual side of things, it's down to you and your mechanic and your team and your, and your stuff. And um, I love the individuals um, because they're different. It was more of a Grand Prix, let's say. You know, the Grand Prix atmosphere is really amazing in today's, in today's world. Um, so if you're going to an individual, it was that. You know, you'd have to worry about anybody else but you. <clears throat> so I guess you know, the question you ask is, do I like one or the other? Mm. Um, I think I like I, I what I what I really liked about the old system was waking up January first and going I'm going to be world champion. You can't do that no more. Mm. That right there was the thing that I enjoyed about the sport was knowing that you can finish the career, you can finish your year off, and have a little bit of fun in November and December, and then January first start focusing on what you're doing for the year, and then you start planning it. You start planning the the team events and you start planning your league events and then your individuals and then you get the best out of them all don't you and you try to make sure that you're getting the right equipment lined up and that's what we used to do anyway it was obviously great having the grand prix obviously but when it did have that one-off world final it did have that special thing obviously because it was all on the night a lot of pressure hard as, hard as hell to win too man yeah. really hard to win it's not it's not easy yeah. i mean it's yeah. not easy a grand prix is not easy to win that's an yeah. individual when you just do a grand prix right <clears throat> that's not easy to win either, but you got to have a little bit of luck on your side. In the old, in the days that I was riding, you peak at the right time. That was what mm -hmm. it was about, right? Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, you got to be at such a high level all the time. You, you got to peak every meeting. And man, I don't know if that, I don't know if that would have been me mm -hmm. um, to be able to do that, but I would have looked forward to the challenge of doing that. Yeah, I've got uh, Thomas Nielsen on uh, YouTube's just put, hi, Sam. Did you have a favorite track in Sweden? Um, I, I, I did. Um, I did have a couple of good tracks in Sweden. Again, um, the prepared ones, but Swedish dirt's differently different. Um, Vestervik was always the hardest one to master because it was just one of those tracks that sucked the power out of your bike. But at the same time, <clears throat> you can have a very different range of gearing. You can have guys on really low gearing versus guys on tall gearing, and they would both win, and that was um, kind of a unique track. Um, I loved Kumla. I love that mm -hmm. shape of that track. Vetlander was another power sucking track. Um, after that, you know, the North Shopping track was a little small one. I like that one too. Um, yeah, I like them all. You know, Hogfirst was one of the tracks that I did finish off my career over there riding in Ros Pagana as well. They're very slick and different. Um, everything had a unique twist to it. It wasn't just straightforward. That track's good and that track's bad. Um, I just loved a good racetrack, and I loved to be a competitive track, and, and competitive racing was, was my secret. Uh, Dan's just put there, he's remembering the good times of our five years together. This is Mr. Gulliger right now. From This is a legendary mechanic that supported me right to the World Championship. Nice. And once, once I won the World Championship, he said, I've done what I wanted to do, and he gave it up. And I went back to the, ne the next year's World Championship, and I lost that one because I didn't have a guy, Danny, that knew the history of what we did in our setups. You know what I mean? So we should have won more, um, but we didn't. And at the end of the day, you know, that's racing. And Danny was a Danny was a super, like I said, he was the guy that 
I let my bikes go and he invented so many cool things on on speedway bikes that are still today wow so yeah that was a pretty cool relationship you had him. wayne carter's just come on he's put <coughs> wow hi, a lot of guys hi, are watching this yeah hi sam and lee great listening hope uh your wow catch up soon nice one he's another one one of the one of the writers yeah yeah brilliant i got uh andy graham's wife just come on as well jill graham yeah uh, there we go she's put, she's put swerve swerve did all right being andy's mechanic in 1990 at wimbledon and helped andy win in the national league riders at coventry and andy won a brand new jawa that night good interview you two wow nice one yes he's swerve swerve swerve's the first one to tell you he's not a mechanic but at the same time he's really good there is supporter in the in the in the in the in the camp and um if you tell him to fuel it or tell him to oil it or tell him to do something he knows the instructions that's cool. So Andy Graham must be uh, so hi to Andy. He must be uh, yeah, with nice jail. So that's cool. Also, just add Colin Richardson has just come on as well. He's put hi Sam, looking good, man. Thanks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Cole Baxter put. Did you enjoy the sixteen lapper at Ipswich? Yeah, that was always one I freaking always wanted to win because everybody wanted to win it, right? Yeah, it's just yeah. you'd have to overthink it, wouldn't you? Bigger tank, yeah. do this, do that, do this, and at the end of the day. It's, I don't think I ever, I never won that one, I don't think. So it's probably one of the ones that got away. Mm. Mm. I just put, uh, someone on Twitter has just put, really enjoying watching you, really enjoyed watching you at Wolves. Uh, makes me happy, <coughs> makes me really happy to hear you talk of your time with us. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, there's this, um, I'm the honorary president now of Wolverhampton Speedway. And um, people ask me, what's, 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 what's entailed in that title you know what it comes down to is they don't forget you know what i mean they forget yeah, that okay. i was there with them and it's it's good and i can go there anytime i want to and uh mm -hmm. hang out with the guys and the team and the, and the door is always open it's nice i think jim here is a cradley fan he's put uh o omer um cradley here he's, <laughs> yeah. put, he's put do you remember coming off twice at dudley wood after winning the world title in the dudley straight wolves trophy that's what I said to you. I came yeah, back and slid earlier, on my butt yeah. under. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I even hurt the myself, the I think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hurt my, I just hurt my hand or something. I think I, I think I did hurt myself there. Yeah. I do remember. Yeah. I just, you know, the, the funny thing is, is, yeah. you know, to win a world championship, you get it. You win a world championship. You ask me, how did it feel? It felt great. But guess what? Yeah. I have to race tomorrow. Yes. Yeah, so what are you going to do? You can't do nothing, can you? Yeah. yeah no. so you, that's what, but it would have been nice to be able to stop for a week and just go, hell take yeah. It all but, yeah, take yeah it you all can't. Can. <laughs> just yeah. always going, you guys, weren't you? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I've got, um, so what, um, obviously you still watch a lot of the Speedway now. Is there any guys that sort of excite you to watch them race now when you watch the racing? Yeah, there's, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of guys on the continent that, um, I, I give, have a lot of, um, I guess, basically, they're, they're quality racers, and you can see it. Uh, when I get the opportunity to go over there and work for the television and see it um, firsthand, you can see the setups, you can see the bikes, you can see the, the pits, you can see the, the mechanics, and you can see what's going on. And then when they're on, when they're on the track, I mean, Bartosz Szymanski, to me, he was, he was the guy that was really letting it go and go to win two back-to-back -back world championship just goes to show that the guy had that that fire in him um which i seen way early on the way his riding style was said man if that guy can just control what he's doing he's going to be real really technically <clears throat> he's well i say get the technical side of his style polished and he's going to go a long way and that's exactly what he's done yeah. and um, he started off slow um when he won his back-to-back -back, when the second one he did um, watching him in the Speedway European Championships, um, I said, well, then again, you know, why is he there? And, and what's he doing there? I have to take that on board, too, because he was an invited person on that first round, but he didn't go out there and do a lot. But then again, did he have to? You see what I mean about that peak and all that stuff? You got to pace yourself, and that's what he did. So the guy was, to me, pulled off the ultimate thing. He backed up a world championship, went out there and did it his way, might have been a strategy he played, but to me, he's probably the one because he's the one that's currently the world champion, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow, and another legend has just come on. We've had all the top guys on tonight. I did an interview with him as well. Mr. Per Johnson's just come on. <laughs> Thanks, Hi, Per. Yeah, thank you very much, man. Yeah, no, Per, per and I, we had everybody says if I ever mention Per, 
um, as a rider when we were together racing, they say, you didn't like him. You didn't get on with him. I said, no, that's not true because that was the press that built us up. See, he, Per was the kind of guy that did what I did. He raced for his team and did the best for his team. I did my team, the best of my team. But guess what we did that everybody has to do? We have to go into the showers naked and stand there after the races and talk to each other, right? And you're just going, you don't got nothing to protect you now, right? And you just say, yeah, yeah. good race. You know, that was hard, but that was good. And you go away and you say, okay, next time we'll do it again. And that's what racing's about. And nice. shit, he was, he's, he drove me to my best. And I hope yeah. I drove him to his best because that's what we were there for to win. Yeah, a lot of a lot of you guys that I've spoken to in the interviews, Gary Havlock, yourselves, all these legends have all said that Pura was a great rider, great competitor. But you had to really, yeah. you knew he was in a race when he was. He got freaking traction where no man could. That was <laughs> what was good. I thought I had him beat a couple of times, and you had to know he's coming wherever he's at. He's like he's like the nemesis of uh, like Yano Pedersen. Couldn't make a start, Yano, but man, can that guy ride a motorbike? You know, yeah. bend it in half and make it work. And Per was just so. Polish. You had to watch that guy's style and I have to take something from what he had and take something from what Hans Nielsen had and Eric Gunderson. Everybody, you know, eyes are on them all. Why are they getting away with that? And then that's how I took that in to figure out if I could do something like that and learn from that. And I'm sure they did the same. Awesome to know you come on, Per. Awesome to get Per on. That's brilliant. Um, I just got Jim. This pretty much says it all about the Cradley fan. Jim said, he hated Sam as a rider, but in a good way, because he was a bloody good uh, rider, obviously, and Speedway doesn't have the ride, uh, the rivalry like, anymore like the Cradley had with Rawls. It was brutal, one to seven, both sides were quality. Yeah, it was just such a build-up, wasn't it? I mean, local yeah. rivalry, just coming down, walking the track, figuring it out, mm. Colin Pratt out there watering the track, and what are you doing? Who's that for, you or us or them? or you know, you had to race against everybody, didn't you? And it was just the whole thing. The whole aura of the whole thing was just something that you you never you, – you just don't get those opportunities anymore, do you? Even my mum's loving the interview. She's put, great interview. Princess Jackie is impressed too that's with her. <laughs> okay. She's loving it. Uh, well, I won't keep you too much longer. Um, you obviously do uh, some of the TV work. Are you still – doing more of that sam are you yeah I'm, I'm doing this i'm doing this few year european championship which is this saturday yeah um, we got we got this one and then we got one in two weeks and then there's two more in july yeah so that's the one that robert robert lambert won last year and hopefully he can do it again but it's good it's a good lineup and um yeah i'm looking forward to it do you really David enjoy all that side yeah i do I, I i more than anything i really do it's just fun to do it it keeps me alive it keeps me interested in the sport which i am anyway um, my workshops are available to anybody that I know if they're going from one side of the country to the other, they stop in and they use my, my facilities to keep their bikes going, whatever. I still got vans and tools and bikes. And, and if I can get on a plane and go and go to another venue and meet up with everybody, I mean, a lot of the same people are still involved with Speedway, aren't they? So yeah. it's good to go hang out. And I still know a lot of the riders. Um, some of them are coming up that I don't know. There's there's some names I don't know, especially some of the Polish and the young ones that are coming into it now. It'd be nice to be doing over there more. Um, but you know, I got a life after Speedway, and I'm enjoying that. So it's I can't be full on Speedway 24 yeah. seven. Have you got a lot of uh, other plans for the future? Or I got a I got a five year plan that I'm half a year into it, and then I'm done. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I so got it got set. So the plan's set out for Mr. Romelenko. Yeah, right? I'm, I'm, I'm there, man. I'm really, I, I'm, I, I've, I've, I've got this thing when I've had my knee replacement four and a half years ago, or it was December, whenever it was. Yeah. It's changed me, man. I'm a new guy. I can do things I never could. I can, I can bend my leg now where I couldn't do that before. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problems walking now. I have my shoe lifts and stuff like that because my, my legs are still one shorter than the other. And I can get around, walk, and people don't even know that I have that handicap, if you call it a handicap. I ride, I ride, um, I, I'm, I've had Harleys my whole life, not because I'm a big Harley fan, yeah. but um, I've had them my whole life. I have a couple of really nice bikes, and locally, there's a group of guys that are all senior age, you know, like me, and we get on our Harleys, and we, we go to pubs and go to country places and just you know there's nothing better this time of year long summer nights this is what england's about I, and yeah, when i'm not yeah. here that's what i crave for coming back for yeah. um and then i got a we got a motocross track at my at, across from my workshops that uh, we play on this is a mini bike track for the kids uh -huh. where where i where i'm based we got a saturday there's three generations of kids there 
Um, I've seen them. I've seen them. I've seen the kids when they were growing up have kids now, and I'm seeing their kids ride motorcycles, and that's all they do. We got banger cars out outside of my workshop. We got motorbikes. The kid, it's private roads, so we got kids that are 12 years old driving cars, learning how to drive. You know, it's nothing more fun than hanging out there in a long summer's night, watching all this go on, and then I get to go out on my motocross bike and play, and then get on my Harley and go down the road. So. And I got my guitars and my amps and my drums, and that's it. I just try to enjoy it. Awesome. I really appreciate your time, Sam. Two hours no with the legend. Wow. And you're on my Thanks. logo. Don't forget, look. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm really sorry it took you so long, but I had family issues all, all winter to deal with. Me. That's totally fine, mate. I really appreciate yeah. you coming on. Absolute honor to get a couple of hours of you. Really appreciate it, mate. Thank you ever so much. Nice one. All right, guys. Hope everybody has a, a good summertime. Cheers. Thank you, Sam. Take it easy. Right on. Speak okay. to you soon. Thanks, mate. See you. Bye. Great. Wow. Two hours with the man. He's on my logo. Look, Mr. Stefan Everts there. Look, the motocross king and Mr. Romilenko. He's on my uh, logo. Love, love that. Uh, some of the guys we got to come on tonight. Here he is. Rocket Ronnie Corey. So many guys come on tonight. Dennis Sigalos, Perry Johnson, Colin Richardson, Wayne Carter. Jill Graham, I'm hopefully Andy's watching as well with Jill. Amazing. Mario Giroux, Doug, Dougie Wire. Wow. I need to speak to all these guys. <laughs> oh, unbelievable. Really cool. Really enjoyed that. Hope you all did. Um, I will share that up tomorrow to anyone who didn't get to see it live, anyone that was working or out and about. Now we're all out in the pubs and things like that and the nice evenings and everything. Um, yeah, so just to let you Speedway fans know as well that I've got uh, another Wolves legend on this coming Monday night, 7 p.m. I've been trying to check when the England games are on and things like that. I don't want to like clash with anything like that. I know what the, the it's on Sunday, but on Monday night at 7 p.m. I'm going to be with uh, Mikhail Max as well. Obviously, uh, everyone remembers the Carlson brothers. Um, I know uh, Mikhail changed his name uh, to Max. I think it's his mum's maiden name, uh, but obviously you all remember PK which I did not that long ago. So it'd be great to get Mikhail Max on this Monday night, 7 p.m. UK time. And a little quick one I can drop now as well. Uh, another superstar American motocross uh, star I hopefully should be having next Thursday night. Not too sure what the date is on that next Thursday. Uh, what's the date next Thursday? It is the 17th for week tonight. I'll be having uh, Mike Gunner Healy, um, top American uh, motocross rider. Uh, come over to Europe, rode all the GPs. Another big star uh, that we all loved over here in the UK as well, coming to Fox Hills and all that sort of thing as well. Uh, glad you enjoyed it, Craig. Thanks for coming on, buddy. From Jardine Conservatories there, much appreciated for coming on. Uh, sponsors Mr. Luke Becker, and hopefully he could be the next, uh, another top American rider coming through with your Brock Nichols and a few other guys that are at Wolves. Uh, glad you enjoyed that, John Crook. Uh, I am going to be having Alan Graham, uh, Callum Marshall. I did speak to Jill. Uh, hopefully we're going to set up Alan Graham at Andy's house on a laptop, I believe it was, that they used for Andy Graham when he come on. Um, so, yeah, hopefully I should be having Alan Graham on soon as well. I have planned that with Jill already. So hopefully we'll get that sorted soon. Uh, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you, mate. Losing a bit of... Uh... <laughs> Losing a bit of timber, as we call it. Um, yeah, definitely was, Craig. And definitely won't uh, forget this one with Sam. Don't really see Sam doing uh, many interviews anywhere as well. I chased him to my heart content for a good six months. But uh, like I said, he did uh, have some uh, family issues and stuff that he needed to sort out and stuff. So that's cool. Um, but yeah, it was just great to get him on at last. And obviously, I'd always add him, as you can see, that side. I've always had him on my logo as well with uh, Stefan Everett. So it was cool to uh, get that get that uh, really uh, really cool that one. Cheers, Lee. Enjoyed the, that. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, you, I'm sure you'll be watching that, Callum. I know you're a big fan of the Grahams, so you'll be cool with that. Hello, Jackie and Mike. Down in sunny Weymouth. Well, it didn't it ended up a bit cloudy in the end, didn't it? But um, glad you got to watch. Hope you enjoyed that, Mother. It was sad and summer Malenko. How's, uh, what was it? Even Jackie the Princess was impressed, you said. <laughs> yeah.
You're not you're not just saying that, guys, because you're all drunk and they're in the caravan, are you? <laughs> I was down for my mum's 65th birthday on Tuesday. We went down there for the night. And then uh, Jackie and Mike's gone there since uh, Wednesday. That's right, isn't it? And you're back tomorrow, guys, aren't you? So enjoy the rest of your night. I'm sure you're having a nice cheeky vodkas down there. <laughs> um, on my um, competition on the um, signed Tommy Cyril shirt, um, I've got 39 numbers gone out of 100 from the Tommy Cyril signed shirt. So anyone wants any numbers of that, you can get in contact with me. For my big motocross and speedway memories, don't forget speedway fans as well. Uh, we're going to have a lot of Speedway guys, a lot of ex-pro Speedway guys are going to be race, uh, riding in my uh, big motocross and Speedway memories BSMA reunion uh, meeting in September, Saturday and Sunday, the 4th and 5th of September. So don't forget, you'll there be it'll be fine for spectators. It's free for camping. It's only £10 for an adult for the entire weekend. So you could, in theory, be there from Friday night, camp there till Sunday night or even till Monday. Uh, for only £10 for an adult and under 16 is free. So make sure uh, you come along. Um, just to get, just to name a few Speedway riders, um, Roscoe's going to, Alan Rossiter is going to get on a bike and ride. Uh, Andy Graham, 1982 British champion, Andy Graham, uh, two times British champion, uh, champion, drop my teeth out there. Chris Louie is going to be there as well. Uh, Ipswich team manager, Richie Hawkins, um, former Somerset and Swinon, Simon Walker. Um, German World Cup rider, Mr. Robbie Kessler is going to be riding. Um, I'm just trying to think without, I don't miss some of the guys out. Uh, I think Paul Lee as well, former Swindon Robbins. Uh, you must remember him as well. I think he rode for Stoke as well. Um, who else is riding? There's loads of obviously ex British motocross stars as well that are coming. I'm just looking to see what someone said there. A lot of uh, some of the guys as well coming down, like I've spoke to Ronnie Corey tonight. He's going to come down with his boys and watch. So there should be lots of uh, former stars you guys would have all loved over them years. So some autographs to be got on that weekend as well and mixing and socialise and enjoy the weekend as well. There should be a beer tent, hopefully. Um, a former BSMA guy is going to be uh, doing the uh, Benji Cockrell is going to be doing some DJing in the uh, beer tent. There's a plan as well. So I'm sure there's going to be some fun and games on Friday and Saturday night. God help us. <laughs> Even Jill Graham sounded like she uh, likes to have a few drinks. <laughs> uh, should be interesting. I think he's bringing the sidecar down as well, Andy Graham, because obviously Alan and Andy Graham have uh, gone on the sidecars together as well. I think they're going to bring the sidecar down and roll it out as well, because it's basically uh, Saturday and Sunday racing. But the legends are just on the Sunday. There's going to be a couple of sessions, about 15 minutes or so, where the legends are all going to go out, ex-pro motocross stars and speedway stars. They're all going to go out together and uh, just do some uh, laps out there uh, for you guys to enjoy, take your photos. Like I said, all these guys will be around over the weekend, so it'd be great to do some reminiscing, some cheeky selfies with all the, with all the guys you loved over the years, uh, autographs and all that sort of stuff as well, so that'd be cool. So, yeah, and for that meeting, I've already got, uh 347 riders uh booked in for it so it's unbelievable cannot thank everyone enough for the response uh the get together of all the bsma guys which stands for uh british schoolboy motocross association which i used to race myself in the 90s it's basically all that sort of era 80s and 90s and and so on are all coming together after 20 or 30 years uh some of the guys have been getting bikes and blaming me for getting bikes um they're all riding again and then having a go again. So it's really cool that they're all coming together. Um, there's some, obviously there's lots of guys that are racing on the newer bikes, but then there's also the two strokes as well. There's a lot of two stroke racing going on out there. So racing all the old bikes as well from the eighties and nineties. Uh, they'll be there as well. Um, can you tag me? Yes, I will be able to tag it. Is Bruce Pennell coming? <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping uh, to have plenty of uh, ex um, pro motocross riders there as well. Spoke to uh, Danish uh, star Brian Jorgensen, hoping to get the British uh, stars there. Fingers crossed. Uh, Greg Hansen, hopefully he's going to be able to be able to ride. Hope I'm hoping Paul Coopers, Cole Nuns, Rob Herrings, hoping those guys are going to be able to come. I know uh, Rob Herrings' son James Herrings come in. Um, hoping he's going to be able to come there and ride on James's bike as well. There's no pressure on them, ex-pro guys. They're just basically going out for some demonstration laps 
uh, in theory. They're not going out there to race. They're not going to go out there to kill themselves or anything. Uh, Jason Lewis, really enjoyed it. Keep it the good way. Thank you very much, Jason, for coming on. So, yeah, so I've got uh, Mikhail Max arranged for 7 p.m. Monday night UK time, which I'll advertise out there to you guys as well. I'll put this out tomorrow. Any of you guys want to share the post as well? Everything I do on here goes, uh, gets recorded onto my YouTube channel. Uh, and there's, for any of you Speedway fans out there, there's loads of, on there uh, on my YouTube channel that maybe not a lot of you even know that I've done. Um, sort of been doing this now for sort of six, seven months. But I mean, like, I did, uh, I, before I did all these live interviews, it was like um, recorded sort of Skype. Uh, you know, there's like the Skype calls everyone's been doing lately with all the with all the shenanigans of the COVID and all that. Um, I did uh, only a couple of weeks ago, I did uh, another live of Ollie Olsen, which is the second one I've done. I did Peter Carlson. Any you Wolverhampton fans, I got PKs on there. On my, uh, you can see him on there. Look, on my, I don't know if you can see that very well. I'm getting up on there. If you go on my YouTube channel, Motocross and Speedway Memories, you can watch these. Look and check them out in your own time. Peter Carlson there. Luke Becker, who's at the Wolves, obviously now. Uh, Bradley Wilson, Dean, Darcy Ward. I did two and two and a half hours with Darcy Ward. It was really cool. Joe Screen. Um, a great one I did with Chris Lewin and Jeremy Doncaster together. Greg Hancock did two hours with Greg Hancock was amazing. Lawrence Hare, Paco Castagna, who got surprised by his um, idol Stefan Everts, who's on my shirt here, got him to pop on, and that was an amazing reaction by Paco Castagna as well when he came on. Uh, another one there with Ollie Olsen, uh, Chris Holder, uh, Alan Carter, that a lot of you guys will know that's Kenny Carter's brother. Come on. I had a brilliant one as well with uh, Bruce Peddle and Eric Gunderson together. You can check out uh, a Christmas one with John Davis, Neil Middleditch, and the Cobra. And Dennis Sagalos was on that as well. And then that was my other one with Ollie Olsen. I did one with Perry Johnson that come on tonight. You can check that out. It was amazing. Two and a half hours of Perry Johnson. I did over three hours with Eric Gunderson on his own. It was amazing. Hans Nielsen was over three hours as well with him. It was really cool. Um, Chris... Chris Morton, Oliver Allen. Oh, Ali Allen. Oliver Allen, the current uh, GB team boss with Simon Stead. He's coming down to ride as well. So Oli Allen will be riding in uh, my event as well. Uh, did one with Simon Cross. Uh, Paul Hurry was really cool as well. Uh, John Davis has gone down. I think I've still got the most views. Uh, 6,000 odd views um, with John Davis. Did three and a half hours. Obviously, John's quite uh, open with his uh, thoughts, <laughs> let's say. And I'm also going to be getting him on again soon as well. So you can look forward to that. I have spoken to him. I did one with Mark Laram an hour and a half. Ronnie Rocket. Ronnie Corey that was on tonight. I did an hour and a half of him. It was amazing. Andy Graham. Uh, Jill's been on tonight. So hopefully Andy's been watching. Did nearly two hours of Andy Graham. That was one of my first Speedway Live ones. Some of the Skype ones. Look, just to roll them off for you Speedway fans. Todd Wiltshire. Is on there, Martin Slominski, who went around his workshop as well. Give us a tour of his workshop. Martin Dugard, Chris Bomber Harris. I did two parts, two different ones with Scott Nichols. Gary Havelock, did an hour and a half of Gary Havelock. I did my first ever one on Skype with Hans Nielsen. I did an hour with Lee Adams as well, it was really cool for me as a Swindon fan. Uh, Bruce Pennell on his own as well, that was really cool. Uh, Jason Crump, when he first was on about his comeback. I did an interview with him and Alan Rossiter as well there at that time as well. So you can check all those out. <laughs> no problem, Craig. Just telling people what they, uh, some of these people don't know, Mother, that uh, I've done some of these interviews, so they can check it out on YouTube. Dinner in 10 minutes from my Laney Lou, my little sherbet dip. So obviously this will be uh, part of the diet plan that, uh, I was going to say something else then about me later. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so dinner in 10. So I've got 10 minutes. <laughs> My mum's mugging me off for rambling. Ciao, Bella. <laughs> Au revoir. Right, I better go. I'm going to have tea soon. Bye from the old man. Look. Swindon Robbins. You might have seen my cheeky little t shirt up in the background. <laughs> So don't forget, people, um, to uh, get into my Facebook group. It's quite surprising that a lot of you guys have not actually got into my Facebook group yet. Um, Motocross and Spear Memories. 
if you just go on there you can join you can uh, invite your friends to it as well if you enjoy any of the motocross and speedway interviews that'd be cool if you could do that um i'm on twitter got the youtube channel that you can subscribe to for free as well and check all the like i said all the old videos out that i've done there's plenty to be coming and plenty to be done um you, i'm on instagram as well so you can check all those sorts of things out there and there's a little video <laughs> across and sphere uk as well my website on the front of there there's a, always a big countdown to the next interview is um you can get onto my youtube channel through that way there's loads of stuff on there as well you can check out oh no why have you got a picture of broccoli on there <laughs> oh god p.s looking slim i'm surprised you can see me to be honest i was hoping you only just saw sam i was so thin that you couldn't see me <laughs> <laughs> wish you were here with weymouth with laney yeah we did enjoy our night down there it was too too short and sweet wasn't it i'm afraid but um you're gonna have to give me a quote man give me a quote what do you want to let's go a quote there i always say my dad's quote that he used to say right at the end of his life he always used to keep saying to me in the last sort of six months he used to say to me it's nice to be important but it's important to be nice Mum, have you got anything for me that I can say? <laughs> Maybe you should give me a quote. How about that? But thank you very much for everyone coming on this evening. We all enjoyed that two hours with Sudden Sam Romilenko. Beautiful. It's on my logo. Look, that's the logo completed. Mr. Everts and Mr. Sam Romilenko. Get in there. Boo. <laughs> So good night to you all. I say ciao Bella. Good evening and God bless. Big love to Princess Jackie, my mum, Mike and Flicky Mickey. Good night down in Weymouth. Ciao Bella from Swindon. Swindon Robbins. Ashby Residence. Live. 7pm UK time. Not across the sphere of memories. Keep us going. Ciao Bella. Good night. And God bless.